Good morning, councillors. I would like to welcome everyone to this virtual meeting of full council, including those watching online. May I remind councillors and officers attending the meeting to ensure that all mobile phones and other communications devices are in silent mode. Can I also remind you that this meeting will be recorded and be available on YouTube via the Council's website following the conclusion of this Council meeting. I would also like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to the Chief Executive and the Gold Team and all the staff of this Council during these extremely difficult and unprecedented times. Councillors, as you know, everyone has had to accept and learn new ways of working, which includes embracing new technology, such as virtual meetings, which I know has been extremely challenging for many of you, including myself, as I'm still coming to terms with virtual meetings. As convener, I therefore took the decision to invite Deputy Provost Kathleen Baird to take the papers this morning, as I feel it is in the best interest of this important council meeting today. Deputy Provost, can you take over now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Provost. Good, good morning, everyone, and I hope you will realise this is my, the first major committee meeting that I have had to convene in this situation. And I know we're not all very good at technology, but we're all trying to do our best. So I hope we'll all be patient with each other and try to help each other out if things get a bit too difficult. So can I please ask if you would mind just using the chat box for the function it is to help the meeting rather than make various comments because if you want me to try and catch up with who's speaking it would be much easier if you want to ask a question you put q in a comment c p o for point of order and d i for declaration of interest because it's it can be a bit off-putting if it's just a chat going on amongst councillors i know you do like to chat with each other and in real life that is very good but when you're trying to run a virtual meeting, it's much easier if you just try and keep things streamlined to help us all. So with these few words, we will now go on to the meeting. Can I ask Scott Hendry to take a roll call of attendance? Scott will request all members to confirm their attendance once their name has been announced so that there's a clear recording of the meeting and all, all can be recorded in the ministry. Thank you. Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I can confirm I've had no formal apologies submitted for the meeting, so I will call out members' names um, for the record of attendance. Councillor Ahern. Present. Councillor Anderson. Present. Councillor Bailey. Present. Councillor Barnacle. Present. Councillor Barrett. Here. Councillor Braun. Present. Councillor Brock. Present. Councillor Audrey Coates. Councillor Audrey Coates. Councillor Harry Coates. Don't seem to have Councillor Coates at the moment. Councillor Donaldson. Present. Councillor Drysdale. Present. Councillor Duff. Present. Councillor Forbes. Present. Councillor Gray. Present. Councillor Illingworth. Present. Councillor James. Present. Councillor Jarvis. Don't have Councillor Jarvis at the moment. Councillor Lane. Present. Councillor Lyle. Present. Councillor McCall. Present. Councillor McCall. Present. Councillor McDaid. Present. Councillor McEwen. Present. Councillor Parrott. Present. Councillor Pover. Present. Councillor Purvis. Present. Councillor Rebeck. Present. Councillor Reid. Present. Councillor Robertson. Present. Councillor Sarwar. Present. Councillor Shires. Present. Councillor Simpson. Present. Councillor Stewart. I'm here. 
Councillor Waters. Present. Councillor Williamson. Present. And Councillor Wilson. Present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask if there are any declaration of interest in any of the papers this morning? I see that no one has indicated that, so I presume there are no declarations of interest. This morning, we have had a request for a deputation from SSE to address the Council in relation to item 10 on the agenda. Can I ask if members are welcome to hear the deputation at the appropriate time? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Thank you. OK, we will now move on to the minutes of the previous meetings and we're asked to approve the minutes of the meetings of the 19th of February, the 6th of March, the 20th of May and the 1st of June. Rather than everyone saying I agree, if there anyone dissents from that, can we please indicate in the box and I'll ask them to, to speak to it. But otherwise, I will take it that we all agree the minutes of that meeting. Deputy Provost, can I just advise um, quickly of a slight correction to the minute of the 20th of May? Um, there's a um, typo in section five. It refers to hybrid emergency powers. It should be hybrid meetings. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Scott. We now move on to paper four, which is the record of decisions under emergency powers. Now, we've all had a copy of these many emergency powers that the Council have undertaken, and this is really just for your information. We've had updates before, but this is the emergency powers at the moment. So I take it we're happy with the content of that paper. No comments, that's good. And now we come to item five on the agenda. Deputy oh, Provost, sorry. Deputy Provost, Chief may I? Like to speak, yes. Thank okay. you. It's, it's item four, actually, it's emergency yes. powers I'd like yes. to speak on. Right. So, okay, good morning, you. councillors. Um, the uh, report on emergency powers sets out the formal record of all decisions made in response to COVID-19. You will recall at Special Council on the 20th of May, we had extensive questions and scrutiny of all council activities and indeed the decisions that were made under emergency powers. This report provides a further update on those. At Special Council on the 20th of May, you agreed that we would continue with emergency powers until the 30th of September with a review as of the 31st of July. You also requested that committees commenced at the earliest opportunity. At that point in time, the coronavirus and rate of transmission was prevalent. I am pleased to this morning, councillors, to advise you that given the positive information we are receiving from government, I have been able to schedule all committees from an earlier start date than had been thought. Audit committee will re-establish as of the 22nd of July, and I have provided a schedule of committee dates for other committees and special council in July, August and September. Finally, councillors, I'm pleased to advise you that as of the 17th of August, assuming the coronavirus continues in a downward trend, we will revert at that point in time to full democratic decision making. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you, Chief Executive, for that update. I'm sure we'll all be quite pleased that life is beginning to get back a wee bit more back to normal. Thank you. Are there any questions on that? Sorry, I've... Councillor Wilson. You have it, a question. It, it, was, it was next paper, Deputy Oh, Provost. sorry. Paper, okay, paper five. Thank you. Thank you. Is it, no, no one else? Councillor... Laying, have you a comment to make on this paper? Yes. Well, well I think my Councillor Williamson's got a question. Is it on paper four, the question, Councillor Williamson? 
Yes, it is, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, it, it was really just to get a, an update on the business grant, uh, grant scheme. Uh, I understand a number of them are actually stopping and stopping shortly. And um, I also am aware of a number of people who have gone to the valuation board to try and get uh, um, their properties registered for business rates. And there may be a delay in them submitting an application. Uh, what's, what provision has been made for that? I think Karen Donaldson would like to respond. Karen. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, at the moment, um, we are aware of the uh, business grant schemes closing as of the 10th of July. Um, I don't have to hand the detailed information of what happens with applications that are, are pending. Um, and um, I would uh, I wonder if um, colleagues, um, either David Littlejohn or Stuart McKenzie, have that more detailed information to hand. If not, then we can uh, certainly provide that information to councillors after the meeting. I think David Littlejohn has indicated that he can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Specifically in relation to the, uh, the the grant schemes, clearly applications that are in the system by, by the closing date will, will be um, assessed as, as normal. I think Councillor Williamson is always also referring to properties that are awaiting to be registered for rates. Um, that's a different uh, issue entirely, I guess, because the, the eligibility for the rates based scheme was that properties were on the, the rates register on the 17th of March or were in the process of being registered on the 17th of March. Businesses that hadn't commenced that process, unfortunately, are not eligible for, for grant support under under those measures. And, and there is no discretion um, on the council's part to, to, to add anybody else into, in, into, the, in, into the scheme. We can't amend the criteria. Thank you. Councillor Barrett, do you have a question? Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. And it was regards to um, items um, uh, taken in June. Um, one was the decision to retrospectively charge for those non-residential care services that have been provided. Um, now, I very much appreciate the letters are to be carefully and sensitively composed and worded, um, but I have past experience where this has not been the case. Um, and I wanted to ask, can members of the Leadership Sounding Board uh, see a copy of the letter before they're, they're issued? Um, and the second question I had was with another uh, June uh, item, and that was uh, uh, approved the write-off of debt and obsolete stock and the write-on of credit balances set out in the report from the Head of Finance dated June the 11th. Um, and I just wondered, um, how could the decision have been taken if the financial regulations indicate that office, officers aren't authorised to write off the debt in that way. I think Chief Executive would like to answer this one. Chief Executive. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Councillor Barrett, um, the issuing of letters is clearly an operational matter. However, I'm very happy to bring the letter to the sounding board for your information. And on your second question, I will ask Stuart McKenzie to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Executive, and thank you, Councillor Barrett, for your question. Um, as, as members uh, would anticipate, we've been in discussion with our external auditors uh, around our, our accounts process and the, indeed the audit process under the current circumstances. Normally, the uh, debt write-off report would go to the Strategic Policy and Resources Committee towards the end of May. Um, the majority of local authorities are trying to complete their accounts process by the end of June in line with normal time scales. Um, as members will, will gather from the next item on the agenda, there's a significant financial challenge facing all local authorities and we're trying to ensure that finance officers are available to support addressing that challenge. Therefore, because the, the debt write-off report uh, is integral to the preparation of the final accounts, um, it was time critical and was approved uh, as such, uh, under emergency powers by the Chief Executive. I would I would add uh, the comment I, I always add in introducing the, the, the write-off report uh, each year to Strategic Policy and Resources Committee. Um, 
We seek approval to adjust our provisions for write-off of debt in the final accounts. However, where further information becomes available on that debt, we will seek full recovery. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Now, Councillor Williamson, you wish to come back. Is, is there some area that you're not quite happy with the answer to? Yeah, I, I am aware that there, there, there potentially is a number of properties who, through no fault of their own, have, have not ended up on the uh, valuation board. And I'm not trying to apportion blame to anybody, but I, I, I do understand that there, there are a number of play, uh, people who have got uh, claims into the valuation board to try and get themselves registered retrospectively. Uh, and I think the assessors are uh, going back to the council with those and saying yes, they should have been on the on the uh, assessors roll before uh, before March. Um, and I'm trying to establish what is the criteria within those cases, and um, what right of appeal have they got when possibly it wasn't their fault that they weren't on the valuation board's register in the first place. David Littlejohn will help to answer that question. Thank you. It Thanks, is. Deputy Provost. Yes, uh, absolutely. If, if through no fault of their own, due to some error on part of the of the, of the Tayside Assessor's Office, that businesses should have been on the valuation roll, but for whatever reason weren't. If the if the assessor is is comfortable, there has been a, a, an error of sort of some description. Then yes, clearly that the business in that case would have been uh, normally under normal circumstances beyond the the valuation roll on the seventeenth of March. In which case we are um, ha happy to process a valid grant claim. On, on that basis, but it does require the assessor to be um, absolutely confident that that is a legitimate business that should have, under normal circumstances, been on the uh, the valuation rule at the cut-off date. So, in, in those instances, th those businesses will be um, offered the grant if they if they meet the other um, terms of the of the criteria. We've been as flexible as we absolutely can. Um, we're very clear of the implications of this for all businesses, and have um, really the, the the local rates team, the local taxes team, have done everything possible to ensure as many businesses as possible have been assisted. OK, thank you. And, and would, would that still apply post the 10th of June, David? Um, the, the 10th of June, Councillor Williamson, I'm not sure the relevance I, I of that do apologize. date. The 10th of July, I, I do apologise. So you know when um, the cut off where the grant says. Yeah, yes, if, if they're in the system um, and the, the, they should have, for whatever reason, be, been considered, um, then they absolutely will be. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Ling, you have a comment you wish to make? Yeah, it's uh, not so much on the on the paper, but on the introduction uh, by the Chief Executive, um, just to put on record, uh, that I'm, I'm glad that we are moving back to committees and I'm glad that we're also moving back to full council and emergency powers hopefully uh, will come to an end because the situation is improving. But I'd like to put on record uh, my group's thanks to, uh, for uh, the chief executive and our team stepping in, taking over the role and uh, putting in the amount of work that they've done. So. Um, as we move back to, if you want to, the old normality of the way the, the council uh, business is conducted, I, I would like to thank them for taking over and, and handling it so well in the interim period. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Ling. I'm sure we would all agree we cannot thank the Gold Command and all the council staff for what they have done over the last few months, keeping us all safe, because first of all, that was what this was all about, keeping us, everyone safe. So. We owe them a great deal of Jack gratitude. Thank you. OK, we'll now move on to item five on the agenda, and it's the unaudited accounts. And this, and this morning, we're, we're asked to note the draft unaudited accounts for 2019-2020, which will be submitted to our auditors by the 30th of June, and they will be available for public inspection from the 1st of July 2020 and will be submitted to the audit committee at the earliest opportunity. So that is just really a statement for, for the unaudited accounts. OK. okay. Deputy Provost, I, I did give indication of a question. Oh, oh so, sorry, Councillor Wilson. Councillor oh. Wilson. OK, Th thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, it's a four-line report. 
All I want to ask is that there will be scrutiny from the audit committee and others in, in due course, but are there any points that we ought to have early warning of now within the accounts that cause any concern? Stuart McKenzie, do you wish to ask say anything at that point? Thank you, Deputy Wollaston. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Um, we're still in the process of, of finalising the accounts um, as we speak, but there is nothing nothing of significant concern, Councillor Wilson. There is clearly some caveats around about the situation in respect of COVID-19. Thank you. OK, thank you. Councillor McDade, do you have a question? Um, yes, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, normally, the Audit Committee would obviously uh, authorise the Head of Finance to uh, sign off the draft on audited accounts. Um, and obviously, I appreciate that the current situation, um, that's not been able to happen at the moment. But uh, my understanding was that we had been authorised a three month extension on the submission of the accounts. Um, so my question is around why we can't wait uh, until the Audit Committee has met on the 22nd of July before submitting those draft on audited accounts. I think before anybody says anything else, Councillor Parrott has a point of order. Councillor Parrott. Yeah, th thank you very much, Deputy Provost. I, I, I don't want to be difficult, but um, I think when you, in, 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 in the words you used, you, you, you said that you, that we were noting the accounts, whereas the, the words in, in the paper say we note that the draft accounts will be submitted. And I'm concerned that we get that right because I, I don't think we can note something that hasn't been published yet. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the words, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious about what you actually said, if I may. Thank you. Well, can I apologise? I am reading what was here to note that the draft and audit accounts will be submitted. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that's, that's fine. Thank you. OK, I'm so pleased that you're being so diligent in listening to every word <laughs> I'm saying. So it's much I'm trying hard. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Purvis, you have a question. Um, I think, uh, convener, we perhaps need the answer to Councillor McDade's question before. Oh, before. sorry. Stuart McKenzie. Thank you, Deputy Boston. Thank you, Councillor McDade. If I can just clarify, um, the Councillor McDade's correct. We, we and I, I replied in an, in an earlier response at the special council meeting on the first of June that there is an extension to the statutory deadlines. Uh, around about the final accounts process. Um, in common with the vast majority of local authorities, we are trying to comply with the normal accounts deadlines for the reasons uh, that I set out in my response, my earlier response to Councillor Barrett. Um, in terms of the actual um, consideration process of the, the accounts, we have been in discussion with our external auditors on the process. Um, what is required uh, is that the accounts are considered by those charged with governance, which in, in Perth Cross Council's case is the audit committee, by the 31st of August to by the 31st of August each year. Um, the the wording in the legislation is that the accounts are considered. The accounts do not require to be approved because that wording is not included in the legislation. And that's a distinction. Uh, which the our external auditors have drawn to my attention. However, um, as the chief executive said, we were seeking to commence a committee's the audit committee on the 22nd of June, and it would be my intention to bring the accounts to the audit committee at the earliest opportunity, i.e. the 22nd of June, for scrutiny. Uh, and I've already written to the convener and vice convener to advise them uh, of the proposals. Do you have a supplementary question, Councillor McDade? Um, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. Um, yeah, my supplementary question uh, was to the Head of Finance in terms of, from what you've explained there, from my understanding, we could wait until after the Audit Committee has considered them on the 22nd of July because they don't have to be submitted until the 31st of August. Is that correct? No, Councillor McDade, the, the 31st of August date is the statutory or regulatory date for consideration of the accounts by an appropriate committee of the Council. The normal submission date for our audited accounts is the 30th of June, 
and because we are facing such a significant financial challenge, the vast majority of local authorities are seeking to comply with that date. OK, thank you. Councillor Pardivis, you have a question. Thank you, convener, um, and it follows on from, from the question that um, Councillor McDaid has raised. Notwithstanding the, the technical point that uh, Mr McKenzie has highlighted in relation to the legislation, um, it does concern me that this proposal is on the table and um, I, in my other role as uh, Chair of the Audit and Performance Committee for the Integration Joint Board of Perth and Kinross, we have had the annual accounts, the draft annual accounts uh, before us for signing off. I, I think it is bad governance for the accounts to be submitted in advance of um, in advance of the audit committee in the case of the council um, seeing them and approving the, the head of finance to sign them. Uh, my question would be whether the, the head of finance or indeed other officers would be willing to hold off um, submitting those um, until the audit committee had discharged its governance responsibilities uh, for the council um, in looking at the draft annual accounts. Stuart McKenzie, are you going to answer this question? I think the Chief Executive will respond. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, Councillor Purvis, I'd like to take advice from the auditors on the point you make and will revert to um, elected members at the sounding board on Monday. If it is at all possible, then clearly we would seek to do that. Um, can I also just add that the Chief Executive also signs off the accounts after recommendation from the Audit Committee? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you. Councillor Stewart, do you have a question? Um, I think the answers, uh, the prior questions and answers have covered it. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. Well, if there are no further questions on that point, we will move on to the finance update of COVID-19. I will now ask Stuart McKenzie, Head of Finance, to introduce the report. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. The report provides an update on the potential financial implications for Perth and Kinross Council arising from COVID-19. As set out in the report, these implications include increased demand for social care and welfare services, the cost of new models of service delib delivery, notably for blended learning, anticipated pressures on council income from local taxes, fees and charges, and increased support for partner organisations. Based on the latest submission to COSLA, the gross financial implications for the Council of COVID-19 in terms of additional costs and reduced income are currently estimated at £27.6 million. However, the situation remains highly fluid and since the report was prepared, the additional costs of the education local phasing delivery plan, which are not included within the report, are initially estimated at over £3 million, accepting that this is a provisional figure. In addition, the latest estimate of mobilisation costs for social care are anticipated to increase from the position reflected in the report. The full financial impact of COVID-19 on Council could therefore be significantly more than the initial estimate. The current estimates also exclude any additional investment required to support the proposed approach to recovery and renewal detailed in a separate report to today's meeting of the Council. As set out in Section 3, the Scottish Government have provided additional funding, notably for support for businesses, but also to support local authorities' response to COVID-19. Increased expenditure on the provision of food and free school meals, welfare fund payments, council tax reduction scheme payments, and health and social care. Excluding funding for business grants and newly self-employed, the Council has been notified of approximately £8 million of additional Scottish Government grant funding to date including funding for social care. Further work is also required in estimating savings and operating costs arising from the suspension of services, which may help to partially offset additional costs. Members are advised that the Council is facing what is likely to be an unprecedented financial challenge from the impact of the pandemic 
and service delivery. And the implications for council income of a potentially significant and lasting downturn in the local economy and from the need to determine and fund investment priorities in support of recovery and renewal. This report is intended as a second in a series of updates for elected members on the financial implications of COVID-19. The estimates will continue to be refreshed as more information becomes available and the Council's strategic approach to recovery and renewal develops. The Executive Officer team and Executive Directors are reviewing current year service budgets to identify mitigating actions and further work will be undertaken of elected members, including holding briefings for elected members in August and September in advance of more detailed consideration of the Council's revenue and capital budgets at the Council meeting on the 30th of September. Colleagues and I are happy to take questions, Deputy Porras. Thank you very much, Stuart. Before we take questions on this report, I think Councillor McDade would wish to make a comment on the last paper, so we will let him do that before we... I know this is a bit confusing, but we'll let Councillor McDade speak on paper five. He wishes to make a comment. Councillor McDade. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, the, I just I wanted to um, comment that I was uncomfortable with uh, the accounts being submitted, even in draft format, before the audit committee had submitted, had seen them. However, I appreciate the chief executive's response that she provided um, that she's going to update the sounding board on Monday um, further to that situation. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. OK, we'll now move on. I know Councillor Barnacle has got a, put a C in the box, but we're going to deal with questions before comments. So Councillor Barnacle, is it a question or a comment? Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy Provost, it's a comment. Right, OK, we'll, I'll take you after we've had the questions. Right, the first question is Councillor Bob Braun, please. Councillor Braun. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, just two questions, if I may. The first one is relates to the, the HRA. Um, obviously, that is, uh, is suffering a financial impact uh, because of uh, COVID-19. And I just wanted to ask if we are uh, happy with, uh, uh, we, we have the funding situation to meet all our, our commitments now um, and in the future. Um, bear in mind the shortfall we have. Are we able to meet our, our commitments, particularly with the increase in homelessness, homeless presentations coming? So. Are we are we happy in that situation? That's the first question. Claire Mailer will answer your question, Councillor Braun. Claire. Hello, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I think, yeah, I would like to reassure you that uh, despite obviously the impacts in terms of COVID on the HRA, uh, we are comfortable that we will be in a position to, you know, cover any additional costs. We're certainly uh, as Stuart has described, currently monitoring sort of the, the impacts of COVID uh, and any additional spends in that respect. But there are also areas uh, across the HRA where we won't have had spend. Um, so some areas we were obviously finding pressures that relates to obviously rent arrears because some of our tenants are facing uh, financial hardship. So we're looking at our bad debt provision, our tenancy sustainment fund, other areas due to the, the delays in the new build, we've obviously uh, will experience um, void rent loss, but likewise due to the close down of our capital programme and our new build programme, we'll have um, less spend or underspends in these areas. So it's an area that we're continuing to monitor, but uh, we're, we're comfortable with the position at the moment. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Claire. Uh, could I have another qu a second yes, question, if I may? Yes. Uh, this is to Mr. McKenzie, if I may. Um, we're obviously looking to uh, put through a, a, or consider a new budget in September. Um, my thoughts are we are obviously seeing a, a, an increase in costs, uh, presumably daily, weekly. Um, if this is ongoing, are we going to be in a position to have a budget in, in September if those costs are continually rising? Uh, in my back of my mind is we have a budget which corrects uh, the situation for PKC on that day, but the next week we could have another shortfall coming in. Um, is that a flexible date or are we are we able to do that? Thank you, Councillor Braun. Um, I suppose I would answer your question in perhaps two ways. One is to provide elected members with a reassurance that, you know, the executive officer team um, and executive directors are, are working on this, so the position won't remain static, um, as you rightly observe over the 
the coming months, and indeed when we get to September, one of the challenges we will face as a local authority is over our local taxes income and the unwinding of the uh, COVID job retention scheme or the furlough scheme and the impact that may have on the local economy. So my view is that this is ongoing work uh, with officers and elected members over the course of the summer. And um, one, uh, trying as far as we can to clarify the situation and secondly, work through options. Um, the, the September date is uh, a date for full council to consider overall um, the position, but I think that work really commences now. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Uh, thanks, Vice Convener. Um, uh, questions on two separate bits of the report, so I'll do them separately if that's OK. So uh, the first one is on uh, Section 310. Um, the uh, funding for the social care mobilisation plan um, allocated to Perth and Kinross IJB is being uh, funnelled through NHS Tayside. Um, but it was allocated on the 12th of May and isn't going to come from NHS Tayside to the IJB before the 1st of July. Is there a reason in particular for that delay? And it also says that it's going to be a first transfer. Is it? Uh, is that a mistake? I thought it was going to be a full transfer on the 1st of July. I think Gordon Patterson will answer that question. Thank you, Deputy Provost, and, and thank you, Councillor Stewart, for your question. Uh, my understanding is the delay in the transfer is because of the focus that NHS finance team are having to give to their final accounts uh, for the year, and we are assured that that money will be uh, received in full on that date. Um, it is the first and only tranche of money that has currently been earmarked a consequence of the allocation that the Scottish Government received through Barnet Consequentials um, and based on an NRAC uh, calculation on the money that should come to Perth and Kinross. It is um, obviously far less than the amounts that we've included in, in this finance report and are included in our uh, second iteration of our mobilisation plan. So we are uh, regularly in contact with government around that mobilisation plan and continue to seek assurance on what further funding may be available and, and when will that come to be available. Thank you very much. To answer your question, can uh, you Yes, it's just it's reassuring to know that it's um, that it's going to be a, 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 a full transfer, um, obviously an NRAC allocation, um, given our um, uh, more elderly population than average than the Scottish average in uh, Perth and Ross is a uh, less than ideal uh, situation. Um, but um, I accept that that was the mechanism that was used. Um, so my second question on a different bit of the paper is for, I think, Mr Mackenzie. Oh, well, I'm not sure who it's for, actually. In section 4.4, .4, um, I mean, there's a recommendation in the paper uh, that um, we get a review of the medium term financial plan in September, but it is mentioned in 4.4 that it is proposed that consideration of the Council's capital budget originally scheduled for this meeting forms part of the agenda for the September Council. I'm, I'm comfortable with that, it's just a, a matter of process. Is that actually um, part of the recommendations in section 7 of the paper that we're being asked to agree to and approve? OK, thank you. Gordon Patterson, are you responding to this? Or is this I'm not sure who's going I, I think I think the chief executive is indicating that she wants to respond. Thank you, Councillor Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, Councillor Stewart, the Gold Command uh, team and I were discussing only yesterday the potential to actually set an additional special council to purely focus on budget matters. So um, I think that's likely that with the Provost's agreement that we will go down that route. I absolutely understand and indeed um, would hope that elected members would want to spend considerable time um, looking at both the revenue budget for the very reasons that Councillor Braun set out and indeed the capital budget. So I hope that's helpful. Okay. Uh, it was just, sorry, it was just specifically, is this 
Um, is this delay part of the recommendations of the paper that we're being asked to approve, just um, from a sort of formal process point of view? Yes, thank you. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you for the confirmation. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, first of all, I welcome the news that we'll get um, the proper time to consider a revised um, and or updated budget in, in September or thereabouts. That's very good news. Thank you. Um, my question, though, is about section 2.17 of the paper, the part that relates to in-year collection rates. And it's just really a point of clarification on there. Um, I believe that the figure for the 1.06% reduction should be read as a percentage point reduction and that the real terms reduction is around about 5%. Um, so um, one in 20 is the actual um, reduction in the amount of cash that we collected is actually 5%. I wonder if someone could comment on whether my interpretation there is correct that the real term reduction is 5%, which is equivalent to a 1% percentage point reduction. Thank you. Good. Who would like to answer that question? Stuart McKenzie? Stuart? Thank you, Deputy Post. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bailey. I'll, I'll try to answer your question, but the 1.06% is, is a comparison of our, our cash collection, our fiscal cash collection, um, compared to the same point last year. So in terms of of, of where, where we are in terms of the percentage of, sorry, this, apologies, the percentage of tax collected. So in terms of where we were last year um, at an equivalent point in time, if you can bear with me for a second. We had collected um, approximately 19.6% of, of our outstanding tax and we're just over 18, sorry, 18.56%, so 18.4%. So there's a gap um, emerging each and every month in comparison to where we were the previous month. That trend is common across all local authorities. So the vast majority, well, not all local authorities, is one exception. So the vast majority of local authorities are seeing a reduction in their collection rates. Sorry, just um, further, if I can come back in on that, please. Um, would you agree, though, that the the 1.06% is a percentage point reduction, but the rate reduction is actually a 5% if we calculate the reduction as a percentage of the old figure. Thank you, uh, Councillor Billy. I'm not sure I could answer your question um, without giving it some, some further thought. If I, if I can ad address your question um, offline, and um, perhaps we can have a, uh, a more detailed discussion because I'm not <laughs> quite following uh, the argument. OK, no problem. Thank you. Quite happy with that, Councillor Bailey. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Clearly, we're facing a whole mass of risks and uncertainties with estimated gross costs. What is it? 27.6 million to up to even 50 million. In part, my question has been answered, but I just want to get clarification as to follow on from what Councillor Braun and Councillor Stewart were saying, and also what the Chief Executive has just said. It's in the paper, we're talking 2.37, an update to Council on 30th September. Um, further on, it'll form part of the agenda of the capital budget on 30th September. Um, I think the key thing is if we're setting a, a, a revenue and capital budget and revised, we've got to be aware of the uh, as much as possible the, the current circumstances and there's is a whole lot of uncertainty so can i just clarify are we looking to have a special budget meeting potentially in october or even early november uh, is there any kind of timeline or is that just something we can't determine just now okay chief executive you can respond Thank you, Deputy Provost. Councillor Donaldson, um, we are intending to have a special council meeting, assuming the Provost approves that under the standing orders, 
to actually review the revenue budget, given the pace of change at this moment in time in terms of the financial implications for this council, and indeed to set the capital budget. And just to follow up, that you're looking to do those on the, the same date, which should be logical, but we can't just yet set you know, a, a timeline on this because of the uncertainties. Is that right? That, that's correct, Councillor Donaldson. So ideally what I would like to do with the Provost's agreement is that we have a, an additional special council that is purely for the um, review of the revenue budget and indeed the setting of the capital budget. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Robertson. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, on on points. Uh, paragraphs 2.22 and 2.23. Uh, I'm pleased that we're we're um, giving financial support to our arms length organisations. Have we any idea of what the um, the financial implications are likely to be from that? Have we got any idea how much that's actually going to cost in 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 terms of um, support? Stuart, do you like to speak to this or is the Chief Executive okay? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start with Chief Executive if you wish to add for the comment, uh, Deputy Post. Uh, Councillor Watson, thank you for your question. Um, in terms of what might be thought of the Council's own alleyos, we are continuing to make um, our, our service level agreement payments and we're not requiring to provide any additional support beyond that at this point in time. Um, although that situation uh, will be kept under review and may change as the coronavirus job retention scheme begins to unwind. In terms of TSI contracts, um, we are, are making a financial contribution, um, which is known as a standby payment. And again, that contribution um, it's, it's an additional cost because we can't recharge all of the costs to capital because there hasn't been construction works over the last few months. But again, that's it. Again, um, that payment is currently under review. OK, thank you. Could I come up back with my second question? Um, have we had any approaches from other um, important um, bodies within Perth and Canoas? I'm thinking, for example, of the Lockery Festival Theatre. Um, are we expecting an approach from organisations like that who we have traditionally uh, supported uh, in this difficult time? I think the Chief Executive, do you wish to come in here? Thank you, Deputy Provost. So, Councillor Robertson, we are working with Pitlochry Festival Theatre. We're well aware of the challenges that they are experiencing at this moment in time. If I can perhaps add to the response given by Stuart McKenzie in relation to the alios, we have asked all the alios to bring back their proposals for recovery and renewal um, by August. So that will help us uh, work with them to set out how we deliver a sustainable uh, offer into the future. Thank you. Could, thank you very much indeed. Could I have just one supplementary? Um, yes. Given the 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 pressures put on on the arts organisations throughout Scotland. Um, are we aware of any special funding coming forward from the Scottish Government to help our organisations like the ones I've mentioned um, during this difficult time? So, um, Councillor Robertson, uh, I believe that Creative Scotland and indeed the Scottish Government are looking at matters, but we don't have clarity at this moment in time. Once we do receive clarity on any matter, we'll of course make sure elected members are briefed on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor McEwen. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Uh, my question stems from a question asked earlier by Councillor Braun regarding the housing revenue account. We had an excellent sounding board on the, the 10th of June in which uh, this was discussed. And my remembrance of that meeting was that 
the level of homelessness within presentations that we are having to rehome is actually less at the moment than it normally is, mainly due to the fact that the Scottish Government has banned uh, the eviction of people from private accommodation. I just wanted clarity that that was actually the case. Okay. Can I ask Claire Mailer to respond to that, please? Yes, and apologies, I should have clarified that in response to my first answer. Uh, you are absolutely correct. Our level of homeless presentations has indeed um, decreased over the course of the, the last few months, um, which we understand in large, uh, large, to a large extent is due to the moratorium on private sector evictions. Uh, so we have experienced a decrease overall in homeless presentations. Perfect, thank you very much. OK, now no one has indicated that they have any more questions to answer, ask. So is that correct? No one else is waiting to ask a question that I've missed out? No? OK. In that case, can I ask Councillor Lyle to move the report, please? <coughs> Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. I'm happy to formally move the finance update. Councillor Duff. Second report. Thank you, De thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, just happy to formally second report and thank the officers for this very comprehensive report on the financial impacts of COVID-19. Thank you. Are there any comments on the report? Um, Deputy Provost, I, I put in oh, a sorry, request. Sorry, Councillor Barnacle, you wish to use the comment. Beg your pardon. Yes, Councillor yeah, Barnacle. Thank you. Um, Basically, without going into any detail on private paper one, in light of the paragraph one, two and seven, two of this report, I personally think it would be wise to postpone any decision uh, on that private paper. I believe that's suggested by Councillor Bailey later. I mentioned that only if I have to leave before we get to that discussion. Just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much for that comment, Councillor Barnacle. If there are no further comments, we're happy to agree the report and thank the officers for their hard work bringing this all together. OK, we now move on to paper seven, recovery and renewal, which is the way forward. And I will invite Chief Executive Can Reid to introduce this report. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Councillors, the report on COVID-19 recovery and renewal sets out the draft approach to underpin the development of a new strategy and action plans that will manage and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and support the well-being of our people, economy, and environment. The approach remains in draft to ensure that firstly, the future strategic direction of this council is set by elected members. Secondly, that it is informed by what citizens, communities, businesses and visitors tell us. And thirdly, that the resources necessary to support its successful execution are costed and agreed within the council budget. This approach is not a remobilisation plan to re-establish formal governance. I've already set out our plans for that, nor does it set out the retasking, redeployment of staff who are currently delivering essential services. A plan to re-establish all formal committee structures is now in place and that has been shared with all elected members. It is important that our strategic approach conveys our aspiration and ambition to be bold and agile, to deliver a vision for everyone in Perth and Kinross to live life well and maximise the well-being of our people, economy, natural environment and communities. It builds on the principle of empowerment within the Perth and Kinross offer to co-create the future of our local area and build a fairer and more sustainable society. Our recovery and renewal approach will promote a culture of possibility, opportunity and capability to strengthen our economy, promote good quality education and learning, address deep rooted inequalities, promote and protect our natural environment and importantly, empower our communities. 
Councillors, COVID has taught us many things. Most importantly, it has demonstrated the kindness, compassion, community spirit and resilience of our citizens, volunteers, community groups, businesses, partners and indeed our own council staff who all worked quickly together to respond to the pandemic. We must build on this, capture what has worked well, what has not worked and what we need to start doing or do more of and what we do indeed need to stop doing. We can only do this by comprehensive engagement and communication with our citizens, communities, businesses and visitors, working alongside elected members across ward areas to do this. But of course, it's important to recognise that we're not starting from zero. We already have rich information and feedback from previous consultation exercises to inform our approach of what needs to change. Within the operating context of this council, we have more than ever over the last three months relied on digital technology to support delivery of our, activ of our activities. And we now have the opportunity to enhance this even more. We need to look at our reliance on buildings, working in a more agile and less bureaucratic way, review our governance and processes, maximise best value, and we must indeed do this at pace. By working even more closely with our communities and businesses, we can and we will make sustainable change that meets the needs of people across Perth and Kinross. The draft approach for endorsement today sets out that we must have a laser focus and concerted effort on five key areas. The economy, education and learning, equalities and fairness, environment and climate and empowerment to support the reset, redesign and reform of all that we do as a council to manage, mitigate and adapt to the short and long term impact that coronavirus has brought to our area. It is recommended that the Council approves the approach as set out to inform the development of our recovery and renewal strategy, that a further report developed by the recovery and renewal member officer working group is brought back to special council on 30th of July, and that the important leadership role of elected members in setting the strategic direction and resourcing of recovery and renewal is both promoted and endorsed. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Deputy Provost, I think your microphone's on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we've got lots of questions on this report and Councillor Wilson, you have the first question. Councillor Wilson. Thanks, Deputy Provost. And thanks, Chief Executive, for the, that um, succinct summary. Um, I have two questions. One is regarding the, the consultation process, the, the engagement and consultation, that's section three, just to seek an assurance that the consultation will be deeper, wider, broader and more fully carried out than the, the sort of conventional consultations that we, we have in, in, in council matters because I think I have a concern that there's a number of individuals and organisations that often miss out on that. That's my first question. Um, and my second one, slightly more technical question on the um, appendix on page 100, um, where there's a reference in the first paragraph to that Deputy Provost just at the bottom of that first paragraph to COVID assessment ward at PRI. I was unaware of that facility um, because I thought all the COVID um, treatment was done at, at Nine Wells, but maybe we could get clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Councillor Wilson. Um, Chief Executive, if you wish to respond. I will certainly respond to the first part of Councillor Wilson's question. Councillor Wilson, yes, I can absolutely confirm that consultation and engagement will be deeper, wider, broader than what we have done in the past. And uh, an extensive communication and engagement plan is currently being worked up and will be uh, discussed and agreed with the recovery and renewal MOG. Thank you. Thank you. If Thank I can ask Gordon Patterson to okay. respond to the COVID uh, ward in PRI, please. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Deputy, 
Thank you, Deputy Provost, and thank, thank you for the question. I will need to refer back to the paper. Uh, I was looking for the reference to that as the question arose. I can confirm that there wasn't a COVID ward at PRI. What we did develop at PRI was an assessment hub where people who were symptomatic could be assessed by um, GPs, primary care clinicians. Um, they would then have been referred on to Nine Wells if it was felt that they needed testing and were symptomatic. So the position was indeed that PRI was maintained as COVID free and when people um, uh, were diagnosed with COVID at PRI, um, in most cases they would have been uh, discharged to Nine Wells to specialist wards. So I think that perhaps um, hopefully clarifies the point that was being asked. But as I say, I, I shall now have a quick look at the papers and see if there's anything I may wish to add. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Uh, thank you, Deputy Provost, and uh, thank you also to the Chief Executive um, for, for that um, report. Um, I think it's interesting to see you mention actually Chief, Chief Executive and acknowledging that there's a, a possibility of, of cutting the reliance on, on buildings. Um, and I would just like to ask, um, what evidence do we have that normal and whatever that's going to be um, is, is actually going to re return back to what we perceive it to be normal? Or do we have any evidence that businesses locally will be looking at cutting property um, costs uh, um, rather than cutting staff? And also, um, I have a second up question, if that's OK. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor uh, McCall. I will ask David Littlejohn to respond in more detail to um, businesses' uh, intent. What I would say is that you'll be aware that we've just recently completed the business uh, survey and David will be able to provide you more detail. David Littlejohn. No, thanks very much. Um, I had just uh, temporarily uh, lost sound there, so I couldn't quite catch the question, Councillor McCall. Would you be so kind as to repeat that for me? Certainly happy to. Um, I'm just wondering what evidence we have that normal or whatever what that will end up being will actually return to what we see it as normal or have we got any indication that businesses may look to cut building and property costs rather than staff? There's, thanks, thanks for that question. It's, it's, it's a really important question. It's something we're, we're still waiting to get some of the, the answers from. The, the business barometer survey kind of indicated that most businesses thus far of the, the thousand or so responses, which is about, you know, uh, it's a significant proportion. It's one in one in eight businesses roughly of, of in Perth and Kinross responded to the survey. The, the, the principal concern is just to get back up and running. And I think it's too early to really make any conclusions or there it's too early for them to make conclusions about what the implications are for, for, for property itself. I think they just want to see how things uh, uh, will, will progress. And certainly the feedback we've had is that what businesses are seeking is guidance. It's clarity and it's guidance about how they can operate safely and, and, and when they can operate safely. But certainly it, it's a question that we will continue to ask as the, as, as the weeks and months pro progress, particularly as the grant schemes come to an end and very critically given the significant proportion of our workforce on the furlough scheme. I think it's probably the second or third highest proportion of workforce in Scotland on, on the furlough scheme. When that comes to an end, I think that's where we're going to see a crunch position for, for, for many businesses in terms of how they then deal with operating costs going forward. Uh, Deputy thanks. Thomas, can I, can I just clarify a point? The reference in the paper is specifically to the council use of buildings. And I think there is huge opportunity for us to do things differently in coming weeks and months ahead. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, um, Deputy Provost, that sort of brings me on succinctly to, to the next question, which is really just a, an assurance now that um, we continue as a council to adapt with speed um, to um, the uh, more as more evidence comes to light. Um, could I just have that assurance from officers that uh, obviously time is important in this? So if we could uh, adapt at speed to any of the information that comes forward, I'm just asking for that. Uh, Councillor McCall, please be reassured that, um, that my favourite word in the dictionary is peace. 
Reassurance accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Williamson, you have a question. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I've just been handed a cup of tea. Um, I, my, my question is, is um, about the uh, welfare rights team. And uh, I think there's going to be a number of people who, through no fault of their own, are going to be looking and seeking for um, uh, services of the welfare rights team and do not have the uh, skill capacity or have never had to deal with the uh, um, universal credit, et cetera, and will find it a struggle to navigate that. I wonder how we can better promote the, the, the welfare rights team and the services they offer in the welfare, welfare rights team to um, uh, of the services they offer. I think they're doing a tremendous job at the moment. I have already made inquiries about doing a leaflet drop to every household, and I was just wondering, is, is this something that we are going to progress with? I think uh, Lynn Brady was, was no longer at the meeting. So Karen Donaldson, are you going to maybe say something about this? Yes, I'm I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, Deputy Provost, thank you for the, 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 the question, Councillor Williamson. The, anybody who um, watches social media will know that the welfare rights is actively promoting the range of services that they have uh, to help anybody who has uh, financial difficulties across our communities. Um, in terms of support, um, we are aware of um, additional uh, inquiries, etc., coming into the team, and we are actively reviewing the resources to ensure that staff um, are, 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 have the capacity to deal with this additional demand and the breadth of queries. So um, the team have invest significantly in learning and development to ensure that staff are up to speed and we are closely monitoring capacity to ensure that we can actually continue to meet the level of inquiries coming forward. Okay. Thank you. I come back, Provost. Yes. Provost. Uh, the, uh, essentially, my, my, my thing is, is yes, I, understand. I, I, I agree that the, the team are doing a tremendous job on social media, but my, my, my feeling is, 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 is not everybody um, probably because of a generational uh, gap um, aren't on social media and I think it's about how do we get that message out to uh, the, the, the wider public within Perth and Ken Ross and my idea is is we do a leaflet drop to every household and I just feel that maybe that is something we should be doing I'm just seeking reassurance yeah. that can be done. Um, the Chief Executive wishes to come in at this point I might be wrong but uh, sorry, I'm sure Karen and I were going to say the same thing, actually. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Um, we'll certainly take your suggestion into consideration and we'll look at a whole range of different ways in which we can um, ensure that um, those individuals who are perhaps not attuned uh, to social media are aware of the welfare rights team and the services they can provide. So thank you for raising that. Deputy Provost, if I can maybe make um, two additional comments on that point. Um, those, uh, the, the other effective way of getting messages out about the support available from welfare rights is using the well-established community groups that we have across Perth and Kinross. They are on the ground and often in touch with people and therefore it's important that our community groups also know to signpost. So signposting is an important way of ensuring that those who maybe are not on social media um, can be um, encouraged and directed to, um, to, to use welfare rights services. And the other point I would make is we have had discussion about maybe um, taking um, a, a roadshow out to communities so that we, when it is safe to do so, having some um, local um, hubs where we can actually have a, a physical presence in a drop in area um, and we will do so um, when um, that is uh, safe to do so and operate within guidelines. Thank you. Can, can Councillor Gray. Thank you, Deputy Provost and Chief Executive. Uh, my favourite word in the dictionary is planning. Now, uh, could I refer to uh, paragraphs 2, 3 and 2, 4? Now, both of these, am I correct in suggesting, are alluding to uh, perhaps less use of office space by the Council? Uh, Gray, that is indeed what is being alluded to. We are currently looking at what um, our workforce wish to do and how it meets business needs. So 
So, for example, some members of staff may choose and uh, we may uh, support them working from home. We may have some staff working part of the week at home, part of the week in an office. And of course, there will always be staff who are required to have access to buildings. So we are looking at all of these matters and indeed the use of council buildings across the whole estate. Um, so you're quite correct in your assumption. Thank you. Could I just add a, a related question? Uh, for information, what is the current situation regarding uh, Pooler House uh, relationship with the council? Uh, Councillor Gray, you'll have to give me more detail into your question. So the Pooler House is currently leased, as you know. We will be looking at the lease arrangements when they become available, um, but obviously I wouldn't wish to enter into commercially sensitive discussion at this moment in time. Um, but perhaps you could elaborate on your question if I've missed the point. Yes, thank you. Um, purely to understand when this lease would be up for renewal or, so, or otherwise. OK, my understanding is that it is in 2025. But I know Barbara Renton is here, so she will be able to confirm it, its uh, time scale. Thank you. Yes, yes, you're right, Chief Executive, it is 2025. OK, thank you, Barbara. Thank you for that. Councillor Forbes. Uh, Thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. I've got lots of questions on, on this paper. Um, I think it's a marvellous paper, so I'm not going to ask them all um, here today, but that leads me on to my question, which is about the makeup of the Member Officer Working Group, which currently reflects the arrangements under emergency powers. So can I ask that when emergency powers are removed in, I think, in August, um, would we be forming a Member Officer Working Group which reflects the makeup of the Council as it currently stands? So, Councillor Forbes, um, I will discuss that with the sounding board on Monday, but I need to remind everyone that the Member Officer Working Group is not a decision making forum and that any decisions would come forward to Council or indeed SPNR when it's back up and running. But I'm certainly happy to have that discussion with uh, the sounding board and take advice from committee services. Thank you. Councillor Forbes, is that your only question? You didn't have That's my, uh, yes, my, my questions on the paper are very uh, detailed and minute, so we'll leave them for another day. I have a comment at the appropriate moment and I've put a request in the box. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Councillor Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Professor. Um, I really welcome the comments from the Chief Exec at the beginning of this report and earlier today about re-establishing formal democratic governance. But I just have a uh, question relating to the paper in that sort of area um, from 2.3.3, page 85, where it, said it talks about being less bureaucratic and also to revise our existing governance arrangements. And I just wondered if the Chief Exec could maybe say a little bit more. So, Councillor Sarwar, I'll give a, a general response that is in, by no means a criticism of Perthink and Ross Council. But quite often what you find over a period of time is that organisations tend to layer policies and practices and uh, over, over a period of time these become cumbersome. So I do think that um, now is a very opportune time for us to review the policies and practices of this council. And naturally, if we're going to be much more fleet of foot, agile, have different ways of working, then we need to review our governance um, alongside elected members. So I hope that answers the question for you. I think for the time being, and obviously we'll talk again further about this. Thank you. Councillor Parrott. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. I'm at paragraphs 231 and 234, and it's the use of the clause or the phrase risk aware. Surely in our operating model now, we're as risk aware as we possibly can be. And, and the, what's really being referred to here is a, a less risk averse or a more risk tolerant approach, which of course carries risk in itself of um, picking up pieces sometimes. Can, can someone clarify that? Thank you. I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Councillor Parrott. Um, the terminology risk aware is, is one used um, regularly by auditors and others. Um, I appreciate your comments and perhaps a more appropriate terminology would be risk positive approach. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barrett. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Deputy Provost. I'm down for a, a comment rather than questions, if you oh, want to take me later. Oh, beg your pardon. My apologies. I knew I would get something wrong, so I hope I'll be forgiven. Councillor <laughs> Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, so I'm looking at um, section 2.2 of the report, which and bullet two there specifically. And really, I, I have a concern that relates to a question. I believe that in order to operate good governance, everything we write has to be um, easy for the man on the street, the man on the cab omnibus is the cliche, I think, to understand. And I have a particular concern that I'd like addressing that that bullet two isn't particularly clear to your sort of man on the street and I'll read it out for clarity. It's the section that reads enabling a culture of possibility, opportunity and capability by listening to what matters and embracing everyone in our community as having something to offer. I think my my concern with that is that it, it might not be meaningful to just a person on the street if we talk to them with the greatest of respect to the author and I wondered if I could get comment on that please. So, um, Councillor Bailey, the report is here for elected members. I appreciate what you're saying in terms of it being framed in a simple and easy to read language. So, the communications and engagement plan will be looking at how we actually communicate what we're intending rather than perhaps using professional speak. So, I hope that gives you the assurance that you're looking for. Yeah, but I'm reassured to hear that the communication with the public um, will be in a in a sort of using a different verbiage. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McDade. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Apologies, uh, my internet dropped out, so I've just returned onto the call. So uh, my apologies if someone else has already asked uh, this question. Um, the paper talks about um, the organisation of the council and um, the need to reorganise and the uh, chief executive mentioned governance structures um, and I'm wondering if um, there is uh, thoughts on that already forming around what new governance structures might look like um, and if uh, the chief executive or someone else could perhaps um, give us a bit of um, insight into the current thinking of what those structures might look like and how that um, final uh, new governance structures uh, might be arrived at. So, Councillor McDade, you will recall at a previous committee meeting in May, we had already agreed to um, under sorry, prior to May, we'd already under, agreed to undertake a review of our governance. COVID has clearly um, set out a different agenda for this council and certainly different implications. So part and parcel of my suggestion, and it is only my suggestion that needs to be worked through with elected members, is how do we ensure that we empower our communities? So how do we stop doing some things and ask our communities to take over doing some things? How do we actually listen more effectively and respond more effectively? You said we did, we are doing to what our residents are telling us. Etc. Now that all forms part of the Perth and Canoss offer and will be part of the recovery and renewal. In terms of the governance structures, I'm a firm believer in form follows function, so we need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve as a council and build a governance structure round about it. But I, I'm, I'm hopeful that elected members will focus much more on devolving governance um, into communities insofar as they possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, my question is around the uh, consultation with staff. I seem to recall at the last council meeting, we did discuss the, re uh, the restoration of the consultative committees, and I see that the JNC is in fact up and running and in the revised committee timetable, but there is no reference to the other consultative committees for staff, either the Joint Consultative Committee or the Health and Safety Consultative Committee, and I was assured the last time we looked at this process that the staff consultative committees would be up and running. So perhaps you can let me know when that might happen. Uh, Deputy Provost, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, uh, uh, Councillor McCall, there has been 
uh, very regular uh, dialogue with all of our trade unions um, that represent uh, the teaching workforce and uh, all other staff groups as well. Um, we in, have we specifically asked the trade unions who sit on the uh, Employees Joint Consultative Committee regarding uh, a meeting of the uh, Joint Consultative Committee um, in line with the timetable that had been set. And they were quite, quite happy that um, the, uh, or they felt that there was no need for a meeting um, at this point in time. They were happy with the with the other engagement and dialogue that they had um, with managers and staff across the local authority. Indeed, uh, some of the teaching, uh, some of the staff, uh, the trade unions on the JCC um, have been attending the GNCT because of the discussions in respect of uh, schools and the return to um, schools in, in August affecting both teaching and other support staff as well. Therefore, the plan is to resume the joint consultative uh, meetings at its next scheduled date, which is September, with the, prov the proviso that if there is any emerging issues that require attendance before then, then we would um, seek agreement to, to have a special meeting of the joint consultative committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor thank Lane. You. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, my questions uh, around the MOGs, the Member Officer Working Groups, um, obviously taking part in a few of them. Moving forward, I, I hope we could maybe change tack on them a little bit. They seem they're often it's uh, papers uh, prepared by officers that we go in and that's what we debate. And as a private forum, I'd like, I'd like it to be as long as everybody's respectful, a little bit more frank, uh, these meetings, and I like uh, that, that we're not actually just discussing one paper, but we can we can use that as a basis uh, to for and and other ideas uh, allowed to 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 form. And I thought that was what a working group would be. I feel them at the moment that we go in, and if we question anything, it ends up being a officers defending a paper and us attacking a paper rather than a forum for everybody be able to, to put forward ideas that could be incorporated in the paper. So I was just wondering, maybe my take on it's wrong, but maybe the Chief Executive would want to comment on how they could function possibly better moving forward. So thank you, uh, Councillor Ling. Um, I recognise the point you make, but it's always easier to get into debate and discussion when there's a paper in front of us all. Um, Officers always come forward in, in member officer working group situations with suggestions and uh, I certainly welcome your uh, suggestion of more frank discussion between elected members and officers. I'm sure my colleagues will feel the same and uh, I have no issue with there being debate or challenge in any situation whatsoever as long as that debate and challenge is both factually accurate and indeed respectful. So I hope that gives you the assurance you're seeking. Thank you, and I'll endeavour to be factually accurate, but I can't promise to be factually accurate. But I'm sure you will correct me when I'm wrong. Uh, Councillor Ling, I can provide you with that assurance. Yes, I will. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chief Executive. I think we'll all take note of your comments there. Councillor Braun. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, this is a question uh, mentioned in the paper. It talks about public transport. There's a question about that. Um, we've been told by all governments that we should avoid public transport, which means people will fall back on walking, cycling um, or, or the private cars. Um, this will have a knock on effect on the viability of many bus routes. And I wonder if we've taken that into account. Uh, it's something which could be affected very quickly, I would think, if people start going back to work. Um, is that something we're bearing in mind? Obviously, um, buses are important to some people. I'll ask Barbara Renton to respond to that, please. OK, thank you, Chief Executive. Councillor Braun, you will be very well aware about the effectiveness of our public transport unit and how on top of um, the situation that they always seem to be, they are in constant dialogue with our operators um, and they will continue to work through issues in terms of um, people's perceptions about using public transport, 
but also trying to maximise the routes that we can offer and um, people who want to use um, uh, public transport to make it most effective. The other issue is, of course, that we are well aware of the increase in walking and particularly cycling um, and our bid to Sustrans in terms of spaces for people reflect that approach as well. So obviously what we'd be looking for is a very mixed approach in terms of how people um, start to move and continue to move about. I think in Ross, but the bus route and the bus network is uh, very important to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, We've got a final question from Councillor Anderson, as far, as far as I know. So if anyone else had a question, Councillor Simpson had one, but he said it had been answered, so we've deleted that one. So Councillor Anderson, I think you have the last question. Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Provost. My uh, question is uh, uh, regarding page 104, the top two paragraphs, which is uh, uh, going on about the reporting, the substantial reduction in vehicle movements has uh, uh, meant that there's been a significant drop in, in, in uh, nitrogen dioxide, etc., uh, in pollution terms. Um, my question is, has there been any um, detailed analysis of uh, whether this is due to uh, less movements of cars or public transport or heavy goods vehicles because there's an excellent opportunity to um, sort of target uh, what uh, would be the better, best way to go forward to kind of keep these uh, emissions down as much as possible. I think Barbara Renton, you'd like able to answer this question, please. Yes, um, Councillor Anderson, I think it's a combination of things, you know, sort of there were much, much fewer cars on the road, um, fewer public uh, buses and also um, fewer lorries. We will continue to look at that and that is why, you know, sort of within the paper that we have today that the environment is a work stream that we want to take forward all on its own, but obviously linking to the other work streams in terms of equality of access to transport, but also the important of, importance of the network to the economy group and the natural environment as well in terms of the, the future economy of Perth and Can Ross. So the, the, that group, the environment group, will look at a number of options about keeping the emissions lower across the whole of Perth and Can Ross while still maintaining people's ability to move safely and swiftly. So just to, to, to clarify, does that mean you will be doing an analysis of uh, these figures to try and, and find out exactly um, where we want to be targeting to. Do, do we want, in, uh, for instance, do we want to ensure that there's less short journeys by cars or do we want to encourage uh, public transport to be friendly or uh, is, it, is it lorries, which I don't think you can do much about once everything starts back, like construction, etc. I think that, that uh, all the options, you know, sort of including all of the three things that you've listed there, you know, sort of would be brought into uh, into play there, Councillor Anderson. So it wouldn't be one thing, it might be a number of solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before you go on, Provost, uh, I noticed David Illingworth had a question and I didn't hear him being uh, uh, addressed that. Councillor Anderson, David Illingworth had a C for a comment. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm not, my eyesight's not as good as it used to be. <laughs> no, I, I hope I've got everyone. I'd like to thank you all, thank you all for your questions. It's been all very interesting and I'm sure we've all learned something from the answers we've been given. So, there's a bit of a feedback here. Can I now ask Councillor Lyle to move the report, please? Um, yeah, Provost, I think there's one or two people asked to comment. I suppose that will come after uh, yes, the debate. But, uh, that is correct. Yeah, OK. I, thank you. Um, just uh, before I uh, begin summing up, I'd just like to uh, <coughs> endorse the comments of 
Councillor uh, Lee, and uh, I welcome debate in all forms uh, of the council, and the moment is an appropriate one. And if he and colleagues have uh, <coughs> ideas, suggestions to bring forward, it's absolutely appropriate that they bring them forward to that forum. Um, <coughs> Councillor's colleagues, as we have witnessed, has been significant, it's been challenging. And um, I think at this point it's really appropriate that I would um, mention and say a few words. The previous three months, before, we would like to thank all the staff for the way that they were selflessly throughout this crisis, which I would remind everyone is still ongoing. Um, many of the staff have taken on different roles within the council and they've worked extra hours and shifts. Uh, work three weekends. I'm aware some people have worked through numerous weekends uh, consecutively. And they're a credit to President for North Council. On behalf of all the administration, I'd like to record my sincere thanks to all the staff of Person for North Council. Moving on to the paper today, um, <coughs> along with our residents, its communities and partners, the Council has responded very well. to the emergency of what uh, just been most affected. The response collectively, which we have previously agreed, and this has been key that we want to focus towards recovery and renewal, and we've learned so much in the past three months that we can work together and hopefully build a better Perthian Con North Council in the future. The Council will have a key role to play in the future of Perth and Kinross. It's vital that we work together with our communities and our business owners or sets out the proposal, particularly in relation to consultation and engagement prior to the production of a renewal and recovery strategy, which will come forward at a future special council meeting. The People of Kinross, and we develop solutions. If we are bold and innovative, we can embed the person can Kinross offer into our future challenge. And I'm happy to move the paper. Deputy Provost, you're on mute. Deputy Provost, that's you. Well, Councillor Lyle, unfortunately, the sound is kind of breaking up. We're just wondering if all members have got their microphones on mute. It would be helpful because that we really didn't hear every word you said. So I don't know whether it was a problem here or with everyone, but um, we know that you were moving the, re the report, but unfortunately, we didn't hear every word you said. So with that, I'll ask Councillor Duff to second the report. Nobody hearing me now. Uh, Councillor Duff, you're on mute and can, uh, Deputy Provost, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, difficult to unblocking my mic there. Uh, Deputy Provost, this paper proposes a draft framework on which we will build our response to COVID-19 recovery and renewal in the months and years ahead and seeks to ensure that we build back an even better Perth and Kinross than before. The review on our stop, start, keep basis is welcome. Quite rightly, as Councillor Wilson pointed out, we need to engage with as many people as possible as part of this exercise. Uh, much good work has already been uh, achieved by this Council during the crisis, as shown in the report and as demonstrated by the selection of uh, appreciative comments in the appendices and elsewhere. Communities across Perth and Kinross Council have also stepped up to the mark and in that regard I was pleased to see the mention of the sterling work done by the Feldy Roo team in Aberfeldy, which has now provided over 30,000 free meals to the, uh, sorry, 30,000 meals free of charge to the elderly and vulnerable in the Tay Valley since mid-March. 
The Perth and Kinross offer model will undoubtedly help to empower and enable communities going forward. As the paper states, we need to be bold and ambitious in our plans. Deputy Provost, this paper is an important building block in devising and developing a recovery and a renewal strategy for Perth and Kinross Council, and I'm happy to second the recommendations. Thank you very much. Now we move on to comments. Councillor Barrett. Uh, thank you, Deputy um, Provost. Um, firstly, um, I'd like to um, associate uh, myself and the Liberal Democrat group um, with the comments that the Leader of the Council made, um, thanking staff for their uh, in, in endeavours uh, during the, the course of the, 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 the crisis. Um, I think our staff have done a, a tremendous job uh, going above and beyond the, 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 the call of duty. Councillor Barrett, your microphone seems to have gone on to mute. Can you unmute, please? Councillor Barrett, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know. I don't know what you got there. Not very much. We got the bit where you thanked all the officers for the work they've done. Then after that, it just kind of went. OK, well, you got that important bit, so thank you for yes, that. Yes, it's very um, important think, bit. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, what I was saying was that uh, I believe that the recovery from this crisis is going to be long and arduous, um, but it will be longer and tougher if we don't act fast and decisively. Um, we owe it to our younger generations that their futures are not blighted irreparably, uh, and we must begin to build a fair and inclusive economy uh, with stronger communities that support those that have been hardest hit and the most vulnerable. I believe that the proposed approach sets the Council on the right course to lead our communities towards recovery and that the Perth and Kinross offer builds on the best that we've seen in our communities. People demonstrating the best elements of human character and nature and doing so in greater numbers than those trying to exploit the crisis and the vulnerable. We've seen crime plummet across Perth and Kinross. We've seen rough sleeping eradicated across the country, something that other cities have grappled with or failed to grapple with, with the same commitment demonstrated here in Perth and Kinross. And that was something that was again publicly recognised by the Housing Minister uh, when I took part in the Unsuitable Accommodation Homelessness Working Group uh, with our Head of Housing only a few weeks ago. We've seen an explosion in people taking daily exercise and physical activity with people running, walking and cycling to enjoy the outdoors, helping reduce stress and increase mental and physical well-being. We're seeing more done in the space of a week, sometimes days, than we've seen for years when it comes to safer streets. And we can see white, if we, if we can see widespread 20 mile an hour zones implemented within weeks, we should never go back to the old normal and its cumbersome bureaucratic approaches. I spoke earlier about the mobilisation within our communities to support our neighbours, reducing social isolation and loneliness, preventing hunger, working together within and across communities. Our communities have demonstrated their abilities to respond at pace and scale, to collaborate with the council and including faith groups and third sector to find and recruit community volunteers. We must ensure that the thousand volunteers who stepped up to the plate to help in the crisis help shape the routes out of the crisis as part of the Perth and Kinross offer. I really like that we are saying everyone has something to offer and to contribute to building back a better uh, future, but we need to make sure that where their offer hasn't been taken up yet, that they aren't put off being part of an active part of that future. We need to recognise that some of the key leaders in our community haven't signed up to a never ending commitment, but were motivated to prevent the immediate COVID crisis. Some initiatives will stand down. For others, we need to help secure people to whom the baton and the responsibilities can be passed on. And this will be especially important where the Council has lent staff to support groups with admin staff, drivers, transport, food and particularly know how. We need to be sure that that know how stays when our staff to return. To, to normal duties, but we also need to think about how much of what those staff are doing whilst embedded in organisations is what will actually build a back a better council and a better Perth and Kinross. So there's a lot to commend about the proposed approach. It's about a can do approach about good enough is good enough, not getting bogged down in proof of concept and data. For me, being risk averse and thinking yes means if community initiatives sound like they tackle specific needs or inequalities, 
Let's not worry overly about long term sustainability and let's help get it off the ground. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you very much, Councillor Barrett, for your comments. Councillor Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, it was just uh, to um, reflect and add my uh, comments uh, or, or voice in support of comments or, or, or questions that were uh, brought up earlier in the meeting. Um, I want to thank officers. Um, there's a section 3.4 in the report <clears throat> um, talking about keeping our process simple and asking similar, similar themes of everybody who's going to be involved in um, uh, commenting and, uh, and suggestions and uh, being consulted on the recovery and renewal paper. So um, I think that it's uh, it's absolutely key that we've got in there questions about what we as a body corporate, the council, are not doing well, um, and what the what what it is that we can support communities to do them for themselves, and that the council could potentially stop doing. That's um, genuine community empowerment. It's really pleasing to see um, that officers have taken on board the suggestion that those questions um, should go in there because how we deal with um, how we deal with failure is at least as important as how we deal with success. Um, I do echo uh, the, the 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 comments and and uh, or the question from Councillor Bailey, and I'm, I'm glad, uh, very glad of the Chief Executive's response in the matter about clarity of language um, and not writing things in um, council speak, if you like, um, and. Um, encouraged but would uh, myself encourage um, strict um, diligence and attention to the uh, engagement and consultation part um, where we're talking about the essential nature of the input of residents, businesses and our communities, um, the people that are experts in what happens in their street, um, what happens in the fields around their um, village, um, are those people who live there and open their curtains to it every morning and look out at it. And we shouldn't always assume that all um, experience and knowledge and um, power um, should lie um, at the centre and that it's really important that we recognise that communities have expertise that we can draw on to support and sustain them and um, uh, that should be a key focus going forward. So I'll draw my comments to a close there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Stewart. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, like everyone else, I, I want to thank all of the council staff, the Chief Executive and our team for bringing this paper uh, towards us today. Um, to see a paper of this detail with these ideas, some of them slightly wacky, but I like them for that. Uh, would be difficult for them to produce under normal circumstances, but to be able to produce this in the middle of handling a crisis like COVID-19, uh, quite frankly, is remarkable. So I'd like to thank Karen and all of our team for being able to do this. I'm a huge fan of this paper. I think there are some cracking ideas in there. Uh, I'd be delighted to be involved in, in moving this forward when the time allows. And I just want to finish my comment with uh, uh, touching on the question I made earlier, which is it would be very unusual to have a member officer working group that doesn't reflect the makeup of the council, albeit I accept the point that Karen made that it's not a decision making body, but it does feed into decision making bodies. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Deputy Provost, and uh, I would also just like to start by adding my thanks to all officers because I think this is a phenomenal paper. Um, COVID-19 is a, a nasty viral infection that insisted that the world had to stop. It's highlighted that we, the people of the world, are more connected than ever before in our history. And it has also highlighted the absolute power of an individual person taking responsibility for themselves and those immediately around them. Um, we can only guess right now what the full impact of this will be, but we can easily assume that people will be facing insecurities and hardships, and that is where this recovery and renewal plan is so essential. It recognises the need for ongoing community involvement and asks those responsible individuals to continue to be conscientious for some time to come. 
It also highlights the changes that are going to happen with our economy and they are going to be facing an onward financial concerns and it raises that those financial concerns raised for people, businesses, public funding and the prosperity of Perth and Kinross as a whole. Make no mistake, things have changed and they are going to keep changing. We are not going to go back. It's time for local government to support where support is needed. And if it's not, it's time for us to get out of the way. And I believe this report does exactly that. And I am delighted to back it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Illingworth. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I'd like to uh, agree with Councillor Williamson about the need to promote the welfare rights team, speaking as a former uh, benefits office employee. The Child Poverty Action Group produces a guide to welfare, which is 1700 pages long, and the welfare system is and always has been and probably always will be incredibly complex. So I would certainly commend uh, Councillor Williams' suggestion that we promote, ev do everything we can to promote the welfare rights team and also to perhaps consider putting out uh, a mail drop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Purvis. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, just to add uh, my comments to some of those that have been made by um, others in this uh, debate today, I very much welcome this report um, and indeed the, the stated intentions to change the way in which the Council works going forward, which I think is very important. Certainly before um, this pandemic, there was a perception within many across Perth and Kinross that the Council could in some cases be um, unresponsive or unwilling to change. And I think that the um, clear um, intention to include a new Think Yes culture as part of this Perth and Kinross offer and recovery and renewal process is very much welcome, where we will try to first think about how we can solve problems rather than look at the obstacles um, that are in our way to doing so. I think we have seen that already during the, the pandemic situation, um, particularly in relation to um, the excellent work that has been done with getting out business grants to support our small businesses and also in um, making further progress, although we had already made quite significant progress in areas like delayed discharge. And while obviously we will and um, staff who have been redeployed will have to go back to their substantive posts and other things will change, I think if we keep that um, clear intention that we should be um, taking a solution focused approach rather than uh, looking at the obstacles that are in our way that will do very well going forward too. I'm also very pleased to see um, and I have made this point and perhaps at risk of sounding like a broken record before um, that uh, best value um, is a key principle of this. Um, for me personally, that means ensuring that we deliver our services as efficiently as possible. Um, and regardless of um, other uh, councillors' own personal views um, on the role of the state, I think we can all agree that we want to deliver our services as efficiently as possible, either to invest in other services um, or indeed, um, in, in my particular case, to try and reduce the burden of council tax on our local residents. So that's very welcome as well. I think we really do need to, to make more progress in shifting the role um, of the council from a deliverer of services in that traditional sense to an enabler of our communities. We have seen, as others have referenced, the um, significant and uh, fantastic work that has been done by our communities during this crisis, helping get shopping prescriptions um, and uh, other helpful services provided to local residents. And I think we have also seen that communities have been far quicker and far better able to deliver some of these things than local residents, which is why I was also very pleased and to reflect the comments that Councillor Stewart has already made, that some of our previous comments about asking what the council doesn't do well or what indeed the council could stop doing and support communities to do instead um, where they can do bet it better than we can um, has been incorporated into this report and will be integral to the consultation. Um, I would echo the comments that have made by, been made by Councillor Wilson and others about the need to ensure that this consultation is as widespread as possible. Um, of course, we will get um, very welcome responses from groups like community councils, civic trusts and other organisations, but it is really important that we try to reach those um, hard to reach individuals and organisations as well. But also noting the point that the Chief Executive has made about not uh, 
we have already done a lot of consultation with groups and some groups, particularly those who are less likely to engage in, in consultations, might feel that we haven't listened to them in the, pa in the past. So we need to um, ensure that when we go forward in doing this new consultation, that we are conscious and aware of what they have said in the past. And I think that is uh, really important as well. And um, so with that, I will conclude. I also welcome the um, involvement of elected members in this consultation process going forward um, and I hope that um, we can um, all uh, work together regardless of our um, different views on particular aspects of this to try and change the, the culture of the council and indeed um, the mindset of the organisation to make uh, a better delivery of services for our local residents. So thank you. Thank you very much Councillor Purvis. I, this time I just want to say Comments should be comments and not a long speech because people have been complaining the meetings are going on too long. So with due respect to everybody, I would really encourage you just to make comments on the paper and not everything that you want to tell us about. I know we've all got a lot to say, but if we can just try to keep the comments to the paper. It would be mo mo very helpful if you don't mind. Thank you. Councillor Barnacle. Yeah, thanks, uh, Deputy Provost. I've just got two points to make in relation to uh, paragraph 23.3, the opportunity to find new ways of working. I would mention two items, um, revising existing governance. The Chief Executive mentioned devolving power to communities, and I hope we use the opportunity to look at the role of community councils, especially in relation to how they work with local action partnerships. Um, Councillor Purvis didn't mention it in his earlier comments, but he and I have been working on a paper for a pilot area committee for Kinrosshire, and we're hoping to continue with that within this concept. And the other point relates to rural transport. Um, we have a number of community transport groups and one of the things that uh, they will need to be able to do is access funding and also when we're looking at the budgets, um, we do need to think about the fact that rural transport does require some extra funding. It is very short on that at the moment. Thank you very much, Councillor Barnacle. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that my comments are specifically on the paper and not right. a general speech. Um, the first point or the first comment I wish to make really is on the opening introduction to the paper that quite rightly states that this that the effects of uh, the current situation we're in will be felt for some time. I think we need to be quite careful when we're talking, you know, all of us uh, about describing recovering renewal as post-COVID because COVID has not gone away and is likely to be with us for quite some time and the situation may indeed be quite fl fluid going forward and there may be further restrictions um, to be imposed at some time in the future. So I would like uh, you know, to, to, uh, for that to be noted and that we use uh, the language that reflects that. My other comment is on section 2.3.3 in relation to agile and flexible working. I think we need to be also clear that agile working is not necessarily the same as flexible working. I'm very supportive of moving to more agile way of delivering services, particularly in terms of project management and um, decision making uh, within the council. So I just think some clarity around those, the differential between the two of those. I don't believe they're interchangeable and they're certainly two different things entirely. Thank you. Otherwise, I think the paper is great. Thank you very much, Councillor McCool. And the final comment is from Councillor Rebecca, please. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I will be brief again. Um, it's just a, a, a brief comment on the community empowerment aspect of the paper, if you like. And in bigging up with and for all Talk.net, Talk Community Group, the North Church and other organisations in the north of Perth that have worked incredibly well in satisfying the needs of the community. There is two important points to make uh, in that slightly shameless um, big up there. The first one is that the pace and agility of these organisations to help the community has been important and I think that is reflected in this paper. And secondly, I think it's a point worth remembering 
is that although these organisations have been satisfying the needs of the community during COVID, a lot of the a lot of these needs were there before COVID and will continue to be there post COVID. And I think this paper is really important that it recognises that and tries to deal with it going forward. Thank you, Deputy uh, Provost. Thank you very much for your comments. I know this is a really, really important paper and everybody did want to speak, so thank you. And I'm sorry if I thought some of you were being closed down, but I think it's important that we try and keep the meeting going. So with all these good com comments, can we agree the report? Thank you. Now we move on to paper eight, education recovery. So I will now invite Sheena Devlin to introduce the report. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost, and good morning, everybody. I too would like to begin in the way a number of um, other contributors this morning have begun, and that is by offering my sincere thanks to everybody who has been involved, not just in the production of this report, but who has been involved <clears throat> in any way, shape or form in ensuring that we have been able to continue to provide our statutory and non-statutory services across all aspects of education and children's services during uh, the, the past 13 weeks of lockdown and that we will continue uh, to provide those services um, as required. I would like to offer a particular thanks, if I may, Deputy Provost, to head teachers and staff teams, to the trade unions, to our colleagues in Tayside Contracts and Mighty, to children, uh, young people, parents and carers, and to council officers not just in education and children's services, but from across the piece, including finance, human resources, property and transport. And also offer uh, support uh, and thanks, sorry, offer thanks for the support received from elected members across the board. The publication on the 21st of May of the Strategic Framework for Education Recovery set out the responsibility for local authorities to develop what was known as a local phasing delivery plan for the reopening of schools and early learning and childcare provision. The approach that it outlined was conditional on adherence to scientific and medical advice and all public health measures. A key principle which would, should underpin each plan and the planning process that was that we should seek to have as many children and young people return at the earliest possible date, as safely as possible. And in fact, that earliest possible date was set nationally in a ministerial direction as being August the 11th for children and young people, which meant a change of a week in Perth and Conross. At the point of the education recovery group being established nationally, the advice from the Chief Medical Officers Advisory Group stated that physical distancing indoors would be necessary and therefore a blend of in-school and at-home learning should be planned for. A week further on from that publication on the 21st of May, there was a further important publication and that was a guidance that related to physical distancing, to hygiene, to public health advice and guidance on risk assessments, etc. Two further publications have since been um, made available to us. One was on the 15th of June and it was in relation to the opening of early learning and childcare provision and one was published just as recently as the 22nd of June which was the national guidance on blended learning. Work on our planning was informed by all of these documents over the course of time with the exception of the one that was recently published in blended learning. We considered how we could maximise the existing school estate to ensure that as many children and young people would benefit from the quality resources that exist within all of our schools, the IT infrastructure, the furniture and a range of practical equipment. We also looked to absolutely maximise the use of gym halls, dining halls, libraries, general purpose rooms, etc. We were grateful for all the indications and offers of alternative locations. And we have, in the, the context of this plan, considered using some of those. Some of them, however, could not be considered because of their suitability and the significant amount of work that would be required over a very short period of time to have them an appropriate standard to be able to operate 
um, learning and teaching from. What we have been doing, however, is looking at a range of other premises from which to operate the uh, critical childcare that as part of the strategic framework was an ongoing requirement for councils to provide. And therefore, with class sizes potentially reduced significantly because of physical distancing, plans were quickly put in place to maximise the workforce, which included the offers of contracts to all appointable newly qualified teachers who had worked in Perth and Kinross. At the same time as this planning was underway, home learning was continuing and still is. Critical childcare was continuing to be provided and still is. And at the same time, a revised delivery model for critical childcare to be provided over the summer period was in train. Consultation has taken place with a range of people, including parents, carers, children, young people, trade unions and staff across the council and a range of other partners. Guidance on health and safety, risk assessments, public protection, uh, PPE and transportation are all in place and mentioned in this plan. Collaboration within the Council and out with the Council across Scotland via the um, ADES networks and indeed across Tayside and the Regional Improvement Collaborative have been critical supports to our planning process. Blended learning is not simply about bringing together two different components, i.e. in school and at home learning. It is about a blend of on and offline learning in school and on and offline learning at home and in other locations and with other partners and professionals. And all of those features were factored in and were to have been continued to be factored in to the plan that is at Council today. We are acutely aware of all the challenges that any model of blended learning poses for children and young people, for parents and carers, and indeed for staff. It's important to note that the plan as presented is one that has been and will continue to evolve and change. And it will continue to evolve and change to reflect national guidance as we seek to increase the in-school attendance of our children and young people where we are able to do so. Yesterday, the Deputy First Minister made a statement in Holyrood in relation to blended learning models. The key points from that statement include the following. Blended learning was developed to restore some form of face-to-face -face teaching. That the picture in terms of the number of positive cases of COVID-19 has improved from the time that that planning started, from circa 20,000 to around 2,000 positive cases, with a view that the position may be even better and more favourable in August. It was on that basis that the announcement was made in Parliament yesterday that there would be a return for all children and young people on a full-time basis sometime in August. It was stressed that that full-time re return for all children and young people was still conditional on the uh, public health guidance and scientific and medical um, guidance indicating that it was safe to do so. Within that statement, local authorities and head teachers were commended for their response to this emergency. And it has been mentioned earlier on, on a number of occasions, that we are still working within the confines and the constrictions of a national pandemic crisis. It has not gone away. There was an announcement of additional funding. New funding of £100 million will be made available over the next two years to support education recovery in its broadest sense. Additionally, it was said that all newly qualified teachers who were appointable would have a contract for a minimum of a year and that there was also going to be additional funding to support digital connectivity. There was mention made too of a project called eSchool. It's a virtual learning environment that ADES, the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, have been working in partnership with to broaden and develop. It started in the Western Isles. And I'm pleased that Education Scotland have recently come on board with us to provide their expertise and their resources 
to help a national expansion of that. We also heard that the COVID-19 Emergency Recovery Group will continue to work through the summer to provide guidance, enabling local authorities to effectively amend their current planning. There are important details that were not shared yesterday, but we recognise that, that those details are likely to follow before the end of the week. And in fact, I can confirm that the first additional meeting of the National C19 Education Recovery Group is scheduled for this Friday, and I will attend that. Some of the details that we don't yet have are around whether or not the start date of the 11th of August still stands as the start date and whether that would be the date for all children and young people or whether in fact for the first few days back at school there might be a phased re-entering of young people into that school to allow a more focused uh, transition. We're also still awaiting um, further guidance in light of yesterday's announcement in relation to the requirements of physical distancing for children and young people on transport. We will begin to review the plans, the risk assessments and everything else that is in place for August to absolutely reflect all of the information provided yesterday and all of the further information that we expect to have by the end of this week. The Deputy First Minister stated yesterday that communication on the revised planning will be shared with parents and carers before the end of the summer holiday period. And so, councillors, what you have in front of you today for noting when uh, submitted to committee services was the blended learning model plan for August for Perth and Kinross. What you now have in front of you is the plan that we would use should it be required if we are unable um, because of any changes in the current uh, scientific and medical guidance to indeed have all children and young people back to school full time from August. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost, and I apologise I, I took up so long um, by way of introducing the paper, but I thought it was important not just to introduce the paper, but to also bring a, a council up to speed with the, the a Deputy First Minister's statement from yesterday. There's myself and a range of other colleagues from Education Children's Services who will, of course, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is going to help, help to have the most up to date information for us today. today. Can I ask I about, the, about the microphones on mute? Because there's this, I can hear myself speaking again, and it's not very pleasant. So, Fiona Sarwar, the first question. Councillor Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Provost. And, um, and may I just thank the. Sorry, that I Annoying. Um, if I can just uh, thank the executive thank director for the paper, paper and the hard work that has, hard been, work put has been put in producing this contingency plan, um, as well as if I could offer my thanks to all of our teachers and education staff for the work that's been done over the last few months um, with all of the online learning for our young learners. I have two questions. Um, my first is I was expecting to see some data regarding the levels of engagement across our primary and secondary learners um, over the last few months. And I was just wondering if it was possible to get an idea of how that has gone for our young learners and if we have something of a detailed breakdown of data. My second question is regarding N NQTs, as you've mentioned, um, they had the commitment yesterday from the Deputy First Minister. And I was just wondering if we we're in a position to be able to say how many we might be able to provide contract for. Sheena, are you going to answer that question? I would like to. OK. You still there? Sheena, I think yeah. you're muted. No. I think technology is just playing on. Thank you. Kind of, uh, Deputy Provost, I am continually unmuting my microphone, but somebody with greater power than me keeps re-muting me. 
Um, mm. If it's possible, I would quite like to leave my microphone unmuted because I appreciate that there are lots of questions yes. and there can sometimes be a delay in actually being able to unmute yourself. So every time I was unmuting myself, somebody was muting me again. I'm not taking that as an editorial comment on anything that I might say, um, but I, I, Audrey, I'm not able to mute myself and, and be heard. And therefore, sorry if there is feedback, but I, I do need to, to keep my microphone on just now. Thank you. Councillor Sarwa, you asked for two questions. One was in uh, two questions. One was in relation to newly qualified teachers, NQTs, as we call them. Um, prior to the announcement being made yesterday in relation to the potential for additional funding being made to offer contracts, we had already um, offered a number of contracts to our newly qualified teachers as part of our generic recruitment process. And we had identified um, through that process a number at the start. And remember, our staffing exercise actually begins in January, February time. So a number of our NQTs already had um, been notified that they had a contract. In relation to primary, 10 were still on the appointable list pending vacancies. And in relation to secondary, there were four and they have all been able to be offered a contract um, and that was uh, agreed and in place before yesterday's announcement. We had um, a number of our NQTs who did not apply, a very small number, I think it was four in total, who did not apply for posts in Perth and Kinross. So that, that's a very promising return in to have people who have been working in our schools in Perth and Kinross over the last year returning. You asked about levels of engagement. Each individual school has been monitoring the levels of engagement um, of children and young people with their online learning, and there was a requirement for them to do that on a weekly basis. All of the schools have information um, around um, percentage of young people who have been engaging with that learning. And it would be fair to say that it is variable across the piece, very high uh, in, a, uh, in a high number of cases, and less so in others. Where levels of engagement were not as high as would have been expected, then just as if young people were at school and there was um, lack of engagement, then that was followed up uh, by teaching staff, by head teachers, and by a range of other staff as well. One of the things that we've asked our schools to do is to provide us with that data so that we can gather together um, information that shows what that looked like across the piece um, school by school, and that was, would help inform should we need to um, resort to a blended model learning again, where we might need to target resource and support differently. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor yeah. Rebecca. Thank, Thank you again, you. Deputy, Deputy Provost. Um, a couple of questions. The first one is just about transition. transition. I think um, even more importantly this year, we get transition arrangements right. We've been very good at doing that historically. But I'm just wondering if you can uh, give us a little bit of detail as to where we are in pupils transitioning from primary to secondary or nursery to primary or indeed just transitioning to a new school for the very first time. Um, my second question, if I may, is just to confirm that these plans still need approved by Scottish Government um, in case, and I hope that we don't, but just the very real possibility that we will need to go back to uh, blended learning if, God forbid, there is a second spike in COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Rebeck, in relation to transition, I think one of the important points to range is uh, uh, to, to make is that transition activities do not just take place in the final week of any school term, although that is when quite a number of uh, you know, if you like, the set pieces of transition do, and obviously they have not been able to take place in the way that any school uh, would have hoped. But there's a number of transition programmes that actually run throughout the year, and there's various events that happen throughout the year across different local management groups that were all obviously able to operate up until March. And similarly, with some of the enhanced transition processes that we provide for young people who may require additional support, some of those will have been able to have actually taken place before lockdown commenced. Since lockdown has been in place, all schools have developed a range of different kind of transition uh, approaches. 
with many innovative programmes in place that have included virtual tools of the schools, online meet and greet, uh, online, pr online prize giving ceremonies, online parent meetings and surgeries. Some schools um, are able to organise outdoor ceremonies to say goodbye to primary sevens and offer gifts and presentations. And some schools have been able to support visits of uh, children, young people and their parents into schools where that has been able to be offered. But we are stressing that normal transition arrangements, you know, will have not been possible. And therefore, when we uh, do resume in the new term, the first week back in all schools will really be an induction week for pupils with particular groups and cohorts being the main focus and that focus on transition. I hope that's helpful for you. You had another question in relation to the role of Her Majesty's Inspectorate. Um, there was an announcement made a week past Monday that the, the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister had asked Her Majesty's Inspectorate as part of Education Scotland to undertake an assessment of the plans for blended learning from each local authority. Um, I can report that in Perth and in Ross, uh, we had a meeting last Friday with colleagues from Dundee, Angus, Perth and Kinross and Education Scotland to provide peer support and challenge as we have done across the Tayside area with the development of our plans since the 21st of May and that our plans uh, were submitted and will be looked at and we expect to receive feedback on those. Thanks very much. I um, appreciate the very reassuring answers um, from our Executive Director there. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, so I welcome the really thorough work that went into preparing for a scenario that now we hope we won't see come to fruition. Um, I, I imagine that was a lot of work on officers and, um, and staff, so thank you for all of that. Um, however, I think it's good news that we're, we're now able to aim for full restoration of, um, of in-person learning. Um, my question regards a section about critical childcare that's halfway down the fourth page. Apologies, my version doesn't have paragraph numbering, but I'm looking halfway down the fourth page of the report, the part titled Critical Childcare. Um, I've had a few residents contact me concerned that we currently plan to have a gap in the provision of critical childcare for a week or roughly a week between August the 4th and August the 11th. Will we now be able to look again at maybe providing continuity of that critical childcare for these really hardworking families who have two key workers in them in, li in the light of the shifting sands? Or is it still going to be impossible for us to provide um, continuity of critical childcare through that one week? Thank you. Councillor Bailey, I apologise because I, I thought I provided um, an answer to that particular query that you sent in yesterday. It may just not have reached you yet, but I, I did respond to that query um, that you, you sent in yesterday. The reality is that the, um, the Children Activity Centres have been running effectively since the 25th of March, um, some of them seven days a week continuously over the Easter holidays. And regardless of the announcement yesterday, which indicates that it will be appropriate to have all children and young people return um, to school on a full time basis in August. In the, the schools where we have run those children's activity centres, it is required that we uh, cease provision to around uh, full cleaning. And the rearrangement and reorganisation of those buildings to enable uh, teachers to be able to get into um, sort out their classrooms, head teachers to be able to, to organise their school for the start of the new term. It is impossible to do both of those things at the same time. It's also essential that we are able to offer our staff who have worked in these hubs all this time that they are able to take uh, annual leave. And so across Dundee, Perth and Ross Angus, we have an agreed stop date of the 4th of August. 
And of course, if everybody is back full time in August, there will be no need to restart that on the 11th, bearing in mind that there would of course be two days of a weekend. So I think it's effectively three, perhaps four days at most that there won't be these um, children activity centres operating. But in order that we can do the level of clean and the reorganisation that is required and for staff to be able to have their annual leave, it will not be possible to do that. However, there are a range of childminders and other um, private providers who uh, we are very happy to put parents in contact with who may be able to provide childcare for those few days where there won't be a children's activity centre in operation. Thank you. Thank you, Sheena. Um, I appreciate you had answered previously. Um, I wanted to bring this to a public forum though because I'm not sure how many people are aware of the situation. Um, thank you for the response. I do acknowledge that we need to allow staff to take adequate holiday breaks. We can't have them overworked and tired. Um, and uh, so thank you for your, your endeavours in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shires. Thank you, Deputy Provost, and thank you, Sheena, for your um, answer so far. A number of my questions have been answered, but again, like colleagues, some of it we want to put into the public domain, not just ask at the, at the sounding board. Um, Recognising the huge amount of effort that has gone into developing the paper in front of us from staff and, and really want to thank them for, for all that work. Some of the questions that we have are around the vulnerability of staff and pupils going back into, into full time learning and, and how they will be communicated with over the summer. Um, I noted that the Deputy First Minister spoke about £100 million over two years to help recovery and any lost ground in learning that's developed over this period. Um, and to, to try and get some understanding about how head teachers and staff will, will assess what gaps have developed um, for young people. Because I dare say that's a concern for, for some of us that have been supporting our children without the qualification of, uh, of our uh, normal class teachers and making sure that those, those gaps um, haven't developed. Um, on the similar theme uh, regarding educational psychology and support for children who might find a return to school a very difficult um, uh, process um, and being asked to go back to sit at a desk when they've had the flexibility of, of their home environment. Um, and my final question uh, for, for this session, just now anyway, is about the cleaning budgets and whether we can expect any assistance from the Scottish Government, because obviously we're going to have to ramp up uh, the cleaning within our schools for some considerable time. And it would be unfortunate if, if we had to take uh, the cash from, from frontline teaching um, and resources uh, to put into that. So, so that's just a flavour of some of my questions and the rest I'll hold back for the sending board. Thank you very much. She thank you very much, um, Deputy, First, uh, Deputy Provost, and thank you, Councillor Shires. There were quite a few points in there, so um, please just prompt me if there is anything that I am missing. If I start at the end, if that's OK, uh, the, the cleaning budgets. From the commencement of lockdown, we across all council services have obviously been keeping very close tabs on any additional expenditure that has arisen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will continue to do that uh, all through the summer and beyond so that for as long as we require the um, additional cleaning and hygiene uh, procedures in place, then obviously we will uh, keep a, a close eye on those budgets. We submit all of that information weekly to COSLA and COSLA and Scottish Government are, are in regular um, dialogue around the approaches to funding for any additional expenditure. Across the piece, we work obviously with Tayside Contracts and um, we are in close contact with them to understand what different shift patterns, frequency, whether we actually need to have some staff perhaps, you know, throughout the day in some of our larger schools particularly. So all of that, we can only at this point have an indicative um, cost estimate for that, but that is something that we will be monitoring. You asked about our educational psychology service from the get-go, they have been proactive in providing direct support to small groups, to families, to parents, to young people, and indeed to staff. And they've been doing that through phone lines, 
through online support, providing resources, guidance, and, and just being on the end of, of, of a phone. The approach to the young people coming back in, I, I made the point of, you know, we, we will need to think very carefully about the return in August. We recognise that for many people who have not been at their usual place of work, if we want to call it for, for some time, that going back into that kind of routine will be quite a challenge. For many, people will be very, very pleased to be getting back to what looks and feels like some kind of normality. But for those who are struggling perhaps a bit more with that, then yes, there is clear guidance that we have been able to provide and will continue to provide to all schools so that class teachers, promoted staff and a range of other support staff are able to provide the right kind of support that is required. We'll be starting with what we've really been calling a recovery curriculum, which is about understanding what have young people been doing where are they with their learning and with no expectations of them having reached a particular point. And it will be that learning, uh, sorry, that uh, starting point that will be the place where teachers start with the groups of children in their classes. We are looking at providing a range of support for um, particular groups of children and young people who we know have perhaps been most impacted in a detrimental way by the lockdown. And so over the course of the summer holiday period, a number of third sector organisations will be working with us to provide particular support for those young people, much of which will just be about coming back together in larger groups, socialising, reacquainting themselves with friends, but also able to provide some support with, with learning. We're also looking to establish um, a group of volunteers who are calling themselves Learning Friends. And these are people who may well have been uh, qualified teachers or lecturers who will be able to offer uh, targeted online support to individuals or in small groups online to actually give quite focused support uh, for any learning that, that may have been difficult for young people to have found the motivation uh, to stay engaged with while well, they, they don't have the, their usual routine and encouragement to do so. So I hope that's helpful. There's a, a whole lot more uh, information available, you know, with individual schools and individual groups, but I hope that gives you a general flavour. Thank you. I think someone was sharing their screen. Oh. This is mm. we're now getting a signal saying it's gone into recess at the moment, so I'm not sure what's happening. Like Councillor Waters. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Provost. I'm getting a lot of feedback again here. Yes, it's not very uh, good. Do you want a few minutes to fix this or will I just carry on? I'm not sure if IT are trying to do something. I'll try and carry on and hopefully hopefully you get the, right, okay. the gist yeah. of my, my, my questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, report here. Uh, I have a, a, a couple of points to make on the, the transport on uh, children getting to and from, uh, from school uh, and especially in light of the the information yesterday because of the good work in suppressing suppressing the virus um, and and the potential that uh, you know that we all hope for that we our schools can get back to the 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 a more relative uh, normal uh, come come August uh, regarding the bus the bus transport and I accept uh, you know and take note of what you said in your report regarding the the you're waiting on uh, feedback from the Scottish government but. You know, are, are, has what kind of engagement will be made with uh, patients and parents to uh, ensure to get a, a accurate number of how many children uh, will be on will be on a uh, public transport or or requiring it, and and also the potential to meet the guidelines 
uh, by the Scottish Government on uh, social distancing and masks. Well, we'll we be looking at the potential of providing or making masks available if that's a requirement uh, at the time the children uh, start back. Uh, second part in my question uh, will be on the uh, drop off pick off points and uh, certainly, certainly given uh, schools uh, around my constituency where the the junctions often get uh, jammed up as it is. If, if you know, we're encouraging uh, uh, children to to walk or cycle to school or to get dropped, more more children will, will undoubtedly be getting dropped off by cars, um, and it wouldn't it would be uh, concerning that if the, the the wider area around schools just became totally totally uh, log jammed and and uh, blocked up with cars, and and just what is the scope? Uh, of looking at the transport for drop off pick off or the the, the road networks uh, to to ensure that doesn't happen is it you know do we have uh, ability to put temporary traffic lights traffic lights in or 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 you know still to be able to stagger uh, uh, start times and uh, so that all the the parents aren't trying to drop off at the same time uh, if we do get back to this new relative normal uh, thank you Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Um, you asked about how have we uh, communicated with parents to understand what the requirements would be. So in the context of the plan that is before you today, um, we have sent out a survey to all parents to understand what their requirements would be for their children and young people, whether they would be intending to bring children themselves, whether they thought their children might walk, might cycle, um, or whether indeed those who are entitled to free transport to and from uh, school would, would want that. 90% um, of parents indicated that where their children were entitled to free transport to school, they would wish to take up that offer. And part of the planning that has been underway, of course, has been around how many additional buses would we need given if um, two metre social uh, physical distancing was required on public transport, then you're diminishing the capacity of buses potentially by a third. Um, and therefore, the notion of uh, staggered times was something that was being factored in because there would need to be staggered runs where that was possible as well. So all of that uh, was well underway. And we will, of course, now look at that again, because one of the bits of information that, that we require to, to have clarity on before we can uh, look again and uh, change the current plans is, is there, a, is the requirement for uh, physical distancing on buses still going to stand or not? Because if it doesn't, then we can look at increasing the capacity on buses and absolutely, you're right, then the consideration is, is it a requirement to wear face masks? And those are the kind of details that we expect to be privy to, if not later this week, then very soon. And that's why I understand that there are many, many questions that people will have. But what I would prefer to do is that we wait to get all of the information and the guidance that will help us produce as comprehensive a reworking of our plans as possible and then share that information in one go at one time to avoid any um, confusion or, or uh, not provide clarity. You asked about things like, um, you know, would uh, traffic lights and all the rest of it be required until such time as we actually work out how many buses are now needed and we can't do that till we know how many we can have on each bus. I think that's a step too far at this stage to be able to give you any kind of answer in relation to that. But be assured that uh, one of the things that schools um, have been working with their parents on and schools know their locality best is around what are the safer routes to school plans that may need to be um, now amended and put in place to ensure that the, the travel is as safe for all as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Purvis. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, I have 
two questions. I'll ask them separately if that's OK, because they're on, on two different issues, if that's all right. Yep. The first one is on the um, what are now going to be contingency plans in relation to the pupils that will, would be um, not having full attendance, only half of the pupils would be in at one, any one time. Um, and the fact, as has been publicised in the press, but also in this paper, that um, pupils might be only going back uh, one or two days a week. I'm assuming it doesn't say explicitly in the paper that the days in between are for cleaning um, b between um, the different sessions. If that's the case, and obviously if that assumption is not the case, then, then my question doesn't stand. But I'm just wondering, is that perhaps uh, one of these situations where the benefits from the deep clean, for example, um, are less than we would get from having pupils in full time? Um, I think that we obviously have a situation where that's to try and combat if pe pupils are touching um, different surfaces and things like that. But if the pupils are moving around anyway, although at that point with these plans they were having to social distance, presumably it doesn't matter whether one tranche of pupils are in um, or another. I know that with the um, the two metre rule, um, for example, the, the risk of transmission is 1.3%. Um, but with one metre, it's 2.6%. Uh, yes, cutting it does um, increase, it does double your risk of getting it, but the risk is still very low. So what, I suppose my question is, would there not be um, benefits of not having that um, additional cleaning and perhaps doing that at weekends in between weeks um, in order to ensure that if we have to go back to these contingency plans, pupils are able to get 50% um, of their traditional learning rather than 40% or less. Okay, Sheena, are you able to answer this? Yes, sorry, there's just a delay in um, being able to unmute. It's not an, an unwillingness to, to come on and, and answer questions, Deputy Provost, be assured. All right, okay. Um, I think I would want to, to start by providing some information of the over 80 schools that we have um, across Perth and Kinross. Within this plan, a number, albeit a small number, but a number of them are able to offer 100% of attendance um, for all pupils all of the time. And almost all others are able to offer 50% of the pupils for 40% uh, of the time. There are two year groups, as was the case Monday morning, where that was not possible within the first couple of weeks. But that would not necessarily have continued to be the case beyond that. That was the returning point. And as we said all along, that the plans are open to change and development, and that is exactly what would happen. In terms of the, the day in the middle, whether that's a Wednesday or if it's at the end and it's a Friday, that's not about providing time for cleaning. That day is much more than that. We recognised from the consultation that we did with parents that a significant concern for them was about supporting their children and young people with home learning. Absolutely not an unwillingness to do that, but a concern about how they do that best. And the reality is that if you have the teachers back in school teaching classes five days a week, then their time to support that home learning is severely restricted because during class contact time, they're actually teaching the class in front of them. And so through considerable discussion with all of our um, head teachers, the, we came up with this proposal, which would then allow all teachers to be able to provide support for all young people who were un, uh, undertaking home learning because they could use that that time away from class commitment to be setting new online uh, work, looking at it, assessing it, correcting it and providing feedback, something that they could not necessarily easily do if they were class committed full time five days a week. Additionally, those Wednesdays allow us to bring in targeted groups of children and young people. So not half class cohorts, but some groups of young people for whom we recognise additional support may be necessary. It also provides us with an opportunity to offer practical lessons 
in smaller groups, whether that be in science or physical education, that are more difficult to do with large groups and with large groups where physical distancing is necessary. We also have a, a group of new teachers, first time teachers who've just completed their qualification, starting in the, what would have been and may yet still be the most unusual circumstances. And it's important that we're able to provide direct peer support for those new teachers. And again, by doing that, we are making sure that we are compliant with our requirement that newly qualified teachers um, get that right kind of support. And what we'd also done was ordinarily the, the newly qualified teachers in their first year of teaching would teach for 0 0.7 full time equivalent of a week. We are asking them to teach for 0 0.8, in other words, four days, and to be able to then provide that kind of support for their classes and their home learning, but also receive some peer support from their mentors as well. So it's not simply about um, closing schools for a deep clean. There, there was much, much more thinking had gone into that day. OK, th thank you for that response, um, explaining the, the rationale behind um, that decision. My my second question is um, again in relation to the what are now going to be contingency plans, but it would still apply um, with presumably um, any measures that require to be in place um, with a full return. Um, in the report, and again, there isn't paragraph numbering, so I'll, I'll just say that the pages on the version I've got, it's 110 under principles for, for reopening. Um, apologies if that's not the same for everyone else. But um, where it says decisions must be made regarding the opening of schools and ELC provision must comply with the national framework um, and then sets out some other um, areas and other legal requirements. Um, I suppose my question is, and I think um, I know Executive Director, we've discussed that before and um, different councillors and, and different people have different views on this, but it would be useful to have some clarity on what is um, a legal requirement in terms of complying with the national framework, uh, for example, and the, uh, the other principles that are set out there and what is agreed by um, consent between ADES, COSLA, the Scottish Government. Um, I know that we have the example with the education collaborators where the Scottish Government couldn't pass the education bill, yet um, ADES, COSLA and the Scottish Government still reach an agreement on this. Um, you know my view, which is perhaps different to others, that, um, that local authorities should have more autonomy in this area, but I'm just wondering what is a legal requirement of us and what, when we say must, actually isn't a legal requirement, but is just the way it's it's done at the moment. But we could deviate that from that should we wish to do so. Councillor Purvis, um, um, I think I'm missing something from what you're actually asking. Could you be more specific in terms of the what you mean by what is our legal requirement? Is it that, you know, we have a legal requirement, for example, to provide um, adequate and sufficient education is the wording of the legislation? Uh, I, think I, it, I think, sorry, sorry. Um, it's just in the paper, it says um, the decisions made regarding the opening of schools and ELC provision must comply with the national framework. Um, I'm just wondering to what extent does that have a statutory underpinning? That, that's the question, potentially. Yeah, so where there is a, any ministerial direction, then we, we require to absolutely comply with that. And where there is um, national guidance for um, things like physical distancing, hygiene procedures, public health advice, then there is an, an absolute requirement that, that we comply with that. So that's what's referred to in the paper. OK, thank you. OK, Councillor Wilson, you have a question. Thank you very much and Executive Director, thanks for that um, succinct introduction and, and coping it with pace and agility on a very fast moving situation. The question on timetable, first of all, Deputy Provost. Um, Sheena Devlin referred to the induction arrangements and I don't know if that was induction or transition or a, a mixture of them. Is there any merit in thinking that 
setting back the start date of the new term by a week or two weeks would help the situation um, in a general sense of of just dealing with the cope, coping with the, the, the pace and change. That's my first point. Uh, my second questions are, are, are even shorter. Councillor Wilson, it's always a question of balance, isn't it, with these things? We we have a situation here in Perth and Kinross where um, through national direction, the start date to our term has already changed. That was when we thought we were moving forward with blended learning. And now we're, it looks like, you know, if all things keep on track as they are, then we will see all children and young people back at some time in August. As I said earlier, exactly when that is, is still a matter for confirmation. And I expect after the meeting on Friday, we'll have further clarity as to whether it is still an intention that the direction that uh, from Scottish Government that we start on the 11th stands or whether there is some flexibility in that. Given that we're approaching the end of term, planning um, and the, the looking again at our plans will, will recommence. In fact, we already had a date in the diary for this Friday to consider what our scenarios would be if there had been an announcement that we would be moving to a metre rather than two metres in terms of physical distancing. And so all of that kind of scenario planning was in train. That will continue during the summer. I think what we want to do as soon as possible, though, is provide absolute clarity for parents and children, young people, as well as staff, about what that is. Some people might say it would be helpful to have a more phased um, approach come the start of the new term. And I think that's all still a matter for, for discussion. And just to pick up on something you said in terms of my interchangeable use of transition and induction. Yes, often, um, you know, transition um, activities are seen as induction into the new process. But if we were looking at induction for all children and young people at the start of the new term, it could be that there's an argument to be made that what we do is look at phasing that over a week or perhaps longer and then everybody back all at once. But there is absolutely no um, decision made about that at all. You'll appreciate it's all still very fresh from the, the time of the announcement yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Second, Second point is, is just, just how, how, how do we assist in the echo? How do we help all everybody involved in the process, including your good self um, and, 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 and the senior staff, head teachers, head teachers, and teachers to, to make sure they get a deep break over the summer holidays for their health and welfare? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. You heard an answer to an earlier comment about the critical childcare that, that I'm very clear that staff do need to be able to have a break. We've also shared um, with all of our head teachers and that they share with their staff that that's our clear expectation. People have been working not just um, in this part of, of the business, but across the piece extremely hard um, over a, a sustained period of time. And, and people should have their holidays. Um, everybody does across the, the senior teams have leave put in for over the summer and we will just work around that and ensure that we have the necessary plans in place for the position of schools reopening in August. I appreciate your offer. Um, I, I think we will, as, as we most often do, just crack on and get the job done. That's what That's I expect to do, um, um, how, how, how do we reinforce? There's an echo again, sorry. Um, how do we reinforce the good lessons that we've learned from the development of home learning in the new world? Thank you. There's there's a range of data both quantitative and qualitative that, that we will gather in that will help us understand what has been most effective. A number of uh, young people from Perth and Kinross took part in an online conversation with the Deputy First Minister 
about exactly that issue. You know, what, what had their experience of lockdown been like in a, in a learning context and in a social context? And those were uh, children and young people who were at different uh, secondary schools in Perth and Can Ross, who uh, are MYSPs and some were students at Perth College. I, and some of those were also some of our um, care experienced young people and what life has been like for them. And that information is invaluable in terms of in, informing not just what we would do different if blended learning does continue, but actually what we might need to do differently full stop. And there have been lots of positives uh, for a number of children and young people actually about what they see as a more relaxed approach to learning and teaching. And yet for many, many, they have commented on the fact that they didn't appreciate how much they did like structure, they did like routine, they did like having people there able just to see them, keep an eye on them and keep them in check and that they will be much more appreciative of that when that recommences. So there's feedback from children and young people, we've had from feedback from parents, we've also got feedback from staff, all of that is qualitative feedback that's helpful for us and as I mentioned earlier, schools will have quantitative data on levels of engagement and we'll combine all of those to understand what we need to do differently. What we're also seeing is across the country, so not just across Perth and Kinross, but across the Tayside area and indeed across Scotland, a much um, more swift sharing of ideas and resources and we intend to build on that and continue with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Zarek. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy, Deputy uh, Provost. Provost. Um, um, with regard to page 112 and 113 um, of the, 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 the papers on secondary, secondary schools, Sheena, uh, would Sheena, be helpful, would be helpful if you could mute your mic because it's very distracting. Very distracting. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm unable to now mute okay. as well because I'm not getting the symbol till it's back now. Okay, thank you. Um, what it states in those paragraphs seems to be at odds with the letters that went out to parents from uh, uh, Perth High School um, and the, the, the planned return for um, S2 and S3 pupils. Um, who are only going to be in uh, for for one day a week. Now, I, I note that the paper is for 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 noting and and comment, um, but not for 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 approval. Um, my my comments are that there there if if this contingency plan has to be implemented, and hopefully it won't, because it looks like the Scottish government have abandoned blended learning. Um, what what is going to be done to ensure that S2 and S1, S3 pupils um, at the high school get the 40% minimum that the other children are going to receive? We need now. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Um, <clears throat> in the plan, the the principle that I mentioned in my introduction was one of maximisation. So looking at how we can get as many children and young people back as soon as possible, as frequently as possible, as safely as possible. There is no um, national position in the strategic framework for education recovery that says, and it has to be this amount for all children and young people. It is about the principle of maximisation. And whilst I acknowledge that um, in the media, in press, on television, the, there were statements made that if 50% children and young people for 50% of the time was the preferred position in the strategic education framework recovery, there was no such um, requirement. And it was always recognised at the education recovery group that it would not be possible to offer all children exactly the same. But what we do have is a position where, unfortunately, there are two year groups who we are not able to offer the same for the first couple of weeks as the other children and young people. However, 
there would be additional um, support put in place for those from a range of other partners and some more targeted online support as well. And that would evolve and change as time went on. And we were fully expecting that at some point within phase three of the route map to lockdown that we might have moved from two metres to one metre in terms of the requirements for physical distancing in school, which was of course allowed more children and young people to attend more frequently. It is not the position we would want to be in. There is nobody um, of the view that, you know, anything less than full time for all children and young people would be the desired uh, position, but we are working within the realities of the constraints that, that we were facing. However, we made it clear that the plan was the plan at the point that it was published. It's a live online document that will change and evolve as circumstances change and evolve. And if we were able to ensure that we could have more face to face contact in school or more face to face contact with others away from school, then that's what would be put in place. OK, okay. Sheena, thank, thank, thank you for that. Um, the second question that I wanted to ask was regard to um, John Swinney's um, third condition that there must be the right protective measures and risk assessments in place in schools to keep everybody with higher risk factors, including teachers and staff safe. Um, how many and what percentage um, of our teachers and staff are currently shielded um, or possess high risk factors? Um, and is the council's plan now for them to return to the classroom? Um, and if not, what is the likely deficit that their absence would create? If you just give me a moment, Councillor Barrett, I've actually got uh, some data here around the staffing situation, which yeah. I'll just bring up and have a look at. So in, you asked about numbers who were shielding. The first thing I would say about anybody who is shielding and who has a letter to indicate that they are shielding, then there is no expectation for them to be making a return to work unless they are not in a shielding, unless they come out of the shielding category. In terms of uh, numbers, we have 81 staff out of approximately 1,200 who may be in shielding or who would have an underlying health condition that would be dependent on the appropriate risk assessment being put in place and which may then in turn indicate that a, a full time return to work in school would be required. But we are absolutely clear that nobody who should not be coming into work will be coming into work, but they may well then be able to work, of course, from home. And for those uh, teachers and support staff who are in the shielding category and are fit to work, they would be um, providing additional support um, if it was the, in the blended model for groups of children and young people through online. And if they are working from home, then they may well be able to provide additional support for targeted groups of children and young people in addition to their in-school um, support. We have um, clarity around the number of teachers that we have available to be redeployed at present and the number of additional um, teachers that we would have required had we um, needed to move to the blended learning approach. And interestingly, because we were obviously trying to minimise the, the movement of teachers, for example, between schools, then our peripatetic staff would not have been moving between schools and could have therefore been based in particular schools and been used to fill any potential gaps. At this stage, we will now need to look again at what that means in terms of you know, how many people won't in fact be able to come in and then how we then utilise the staff that we have available to, to provide cover for that. I would have to say to Councillor Barrett at this stage, um, moving to all children and young people back is not at this point a significant concern. It is something that is live and we're looking at, but we think we'll be able to manage that. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, also, thank you very much indeed to Ms Devlin and the team for doing all this work. It must be so destroying to do an awful lot of work for something that you end up having to uh, put to one side because of change in policy at the last minute. Um, this has already been touched on, but my concern is actually regarding brain development within children um, and the importance of social interaction on that. Um, do we have any data of any ongoing concerns that we may have regarding the psychological uh, effect on children um, that this lockdown has caused? And um, if it has been created, what we do about that? Thank you. Councillor McCall, there, there's been quite a bit of um, work undertaken by various academics over the, the period of lockdown. And I know that um, colleagues in schools and at the centre in Perth and Gnos have contributed our knowledge and understanding of that to some of that national work. Um, and we've done that on the basis that we are then able to receive copies of any of the research that has been undertaken so that can help inform our work. We also have done a survey with all of our staff across education and children's services, so teachers, head teachers, uh, social work, uh, a range of, of support staff, so that they were able to um, let us know several things. How readily were they able to keep in contact with those children that they thought most needed support and similarly with their families? to identify children and families who they might not have had significant concerns about at the start of the lockdown period, but as time has gone on, they have become a concern. And we have been making sure that we've been responding to that in real time, so not waiting. As soon as we've got that information, then through a range of different means, some online and some actually uh, socially distanced, but face to face supports have been put in place. Some of that's been on telephone, some of that's been using apps, some of that's been through things like Microsoft Teams and um, Glow, and some of it, as I say, has been in people's gardens or in parks or actually in the, the children activity centres where we have um, had staff like our educational psychologists all attached to a particular children's activity centre where they have been able to provide uh, ongoing and live support. So it's something that we're very conscious of. And we do recognise that for um, a number of young people, they will have found this a very, very challenging and perhaps traumatic experience. We also know that a number of young people and indeed families have been much more resilient than we might have expected. And that's been really pleasing to see. Thank you very much. Councillor Pover, you've got a question you want to ask. It's linked to that one. Councillor Pover. Thank you, uh, De Deputy Provost. I just wondered, it was following on from Councillor Barrett's question, and I was just wondering about how many children in Perth and Kinross have underlying health issues that might be required to shield and how that would be managed um, going forward. I, maybe that question can be answered offline. It seems to be a bit of a technical issue at the moment. Councillor Pover, yeah. is that OK? Yes. Councillor Pover, sorry, my entire system crashed at that point. I'm now back up and running. You were asking about young people with underlying health conditions. That was something that we had um, obviously prepared for in terms of the blended learning model, because we would not be anticipating that those uh, children and young people return to school if they are shielding, and it will be the same supports that we'll be able to put in place for them in this new model. There is no requirement for anybody who um, is in the shielding category to be returning uh, to either their place of work or to school for their learning. We will support them with uh, online learning and um, the offline at home learning as well, because we know that there's um, a number of parents and children and young people who actually like some of the resource packs that we've been able to provide for them to be working through at home. And that also helps reduce, of course, the amount of screen time that young people have. That's lovely. Thanks very much, Sheena. Um, Sharon Johnson, do you wish to add anything to that 
answer from Sheena. Uh, thank you, Deputy Provis. No, I was hoping to help Sheena out when she was having her difficulties. Um, you know, she's answered the question um, as I would have yet. We've got plans in place and we're, we're well um, prepared to support those children who can't attend school. OK, thank you very much. I know a lot of you are asking, asking if we can have a break, but this is not the time. We cannot have a break during an actual bit of a paper, so you'll just have to be patient and um, we should have probably had a break earlier on, but I'll take responsibility for that. So can I now ask Councillor Lyle to move the paper as there are no more questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Um, <coughs> I'd like to, to move the paper and I'd firstly like to thank the Director of Education and her staff for the very challenging work um, that they've had to go through in the last few weeks and bringing this paper together and putting it forward to, before us today. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank the Director of Education for her introduction today, giving the First Minister, uh, Deputy First Minister's announcements in Parliament yesterday, and thank her for the fulsome responses to the many questions which were placed before her today. And with that, I'm happy to move the paper. Can I ask Councillor Duff to second the paper, please? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Uh, yesterday's change of direction from the Cabinet Secretary for Education will, I am certain, be welcomed by parents across our local authority area who are relieved that the Scottish Government has listened to their concerns for their children's education and will now work towards a full return to education for all pupils in all August. We acknowledge that this local phasing plan will be a contingency should the currently improving situation adversely uh, change in future. Much work has gone into the preparation of these plans by our education and children's services, by local head teachers and their staff, and by the professional associations and trade unions and commend those involved for the work in this report. I would particularly like to take the opportunity to thank the executive director and officers for a number of things, the delivery of key worker and, and additional support need childcare, the provision of devices and internet packages for disadvantaged children learning at home, the provision of free school meal payments to vulnerable families and for the consultation and engagement with parents and parent councils throughout this pandemic. The delivery of a return to full-time education in August will still take a significant effort in terms of planning, preparation and finance, and I look forward to seeing the details in due course. In the meantime, I'm happy to second the paper. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you very much. Councillor Shires, you wish to comment? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, echoing the comments from uh, Councillor Duff, I suppose this has been, if you talk about challenges and opportunities, this has been a huge challenge for all of um, all of us really, but uh, the, the staff in education and children's services. But hopefully from it, there's come opportunities. We've seen parents getting really engaged in, in more of an understanding about their children's learning, perhaps appreciating a bit more the, the, the jobs that our education staff actually do day to day. Um, we've seen parents getting engaged in parent council meetings because we've moved to a different format, which is fantastic. Um, and we need to harness all of that. Significantly, we'd had delays in our aspiration as a local authority to move to, to virtual learning um, as part of the expansion of our offer of subject choice. Um, and I think that staff maybe now realise a lot more about their capabilities and the opportunities that that presents for young people as well. So whilst we completely recognise what a difficult period this has been, I really hope as a local authority we can use this as an, an opportunity to, to make real, to use the chief executive's word, pace, um, pace in our change and to grasp all the things that we, we have learned and, and work with our communities to develop an even better education offer for Power Thinking Ops. Thank you very much. Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Deputy Provost. I just wanted to say that since late March, ECS have dealt with a huge burden of disruptive change introduced at very short notice. They have then, while continuing to deliver, planned for a very complex new situation which was subject to ongoing change and evolution. That we are now able to contemplate a more normal situation imposes further planning 
while we retain a contingency plan for more constrained circumstances, which I hope don't arise. I believe we should all be most grateful for the way that all in ECS have responded and continue to respond most magnificently to a massively challenging set of circumstances. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you. Councillor Rebeck. Uh, thank you very much again, Deputy Provost. I will be as quick as I can. I appreciate people are needing lunch and peas and all the rest of it anyway. That was maybe too much information. Um, but it is important that we also make thanks on behalf of the SNP group. And I speak for myself, but I'm sure I don't speak only for myself, that we don't make these thanks because, well, I don't make these thanks because I feel I have to. I make them because uh, I mean it. Um, and I too also want to thank the staff and everybody that's been working in the childcare activity centres for vulnerable kids. It's been really important to keep them safe and it's been really important in allowing essential workers and key workers to get to work, so it is appreciated. And I also want to thank um, local teaching unions and professional bodies for the collaborative and positive way that they've engaged in this process. Uh, and of course, I also want to pay tribute to the staff that have put this plan together in challenging circumstances. This work has been and will remain vital. Uh, it, I hope it's never necessary to put these plans in place, but it is important that we have a plan be there if the virus rears its ugly head again, that is able to be put in place quickly, that's competent and that we're able to, that, that parents will be able to have confidence in. And I think there will be young learners with serious underlying health conditions or who, who have them themselves or their families and that they might need to, they may not be in full time schooling all the time and we will need to be supportive of them, of course. I think it's very important to note as well that the challenges that we have faced and we will continue to face going forward are not as a result of any political administrations, either in this council or in the Scottish Government. They lie solely at the door of COVID-19. And to that effect, I welcome the collaborative way that we have worked together in Perth and Cumbros Council. And I welcome John Swinney's announcement of £100 million yesterday and the reassurance that newly qualified teachers will have an opportunity to contribute to our educational recovery. It is important that we continue working together to make sure the class of 2020 are able to thrive and flourish going forward. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you very much for these remarks. Um, Councillor Anderson. Councillor Anderson, you wish to make a comment? OK, Councillor Barnacle. Yes, thanks, Deputy Provost. Just really echoing uh, one or two previous speakers. We've now got a local phasing contingency plan and the work for that would have been essential as has been said um, because you need that uh, with the changing situation. Whilst the Scottish Government have changed their position and I welcome that, I welcome the possibility of a full return to normal, as normal schooling as possible in August and the main reason for that I think children have been really affected by this lockdown educationally and in their lack of interaction with other children. So I'm really glad that we're possibly able to move to a full return. But well done to the staff for producing a very good contingency plan. Um, if we're having a break very shortly, I think I may have to call a halt and leave the meeting uh, Deputy Provost at that point. I think I intimated that to you earlier. So, um, but I just wanted to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Barnacle. Um, Councillor McDade. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, yeah, no, I would like to uh, thank officers for 
preparing uh, what are now the contingency plans. Um, I very much uh, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement yesterday, um, as I think uh, most parents do. Uh, we had a lot of correspondence from parents in recent weeks. Um, and I think from my point of view, what I wanted to add to the discussion was it's not just um, obviously the children who you know have been really affected by this in terms of their education but parents have obviously uh, really struggled to uh, teach children at home hold down jobs many of them are still working full-time from home or part-time from home um, but also for uh, as we reopen the economy it's absolutely vital that parents are able to get back to work um, and to ensure that children um, are not then compounded by being in poverty because parents are unable to work. So I think it's really important that you know we do see this return to full time education post the summer and I'm you know delighted that um, that is now what we are working towards. Thank you very much Councillor McDaid. I as far as I'm aware there are there are no one no one else is looking to make any comment on this paper. So if we're happy to agree this report, this report, and I would just like to thank everybody for for their comments because they've been very helpful, and we have given this paper the time it deserves. So, with that in mind, we are now. Agreed. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. I agreed, but my screen's frozen. All There's right. Oh. I've dropped I down. Yeah, I did give you the opportunity, Councillor Anderson, to make a comment, but that's obviously when you had no 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 screen. Right. Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm back in or not. Uh, uh, the the cursor seems to freeze now and again. I can't get a message out. I won't bother commenting. Right. Won't waste your time. Thank you. Right. Okay, we are going to have a short short a recess of thirty minutes. So can I say for those people who are watching? the public watching, there will be a new link uploaded for them to watch the live broadcast when it will begin again at 1.15. OK, councillors? So we we leave this and we will come back at 1.15. Is that correct, Scott, yeah. or somebody? Um, Deputy Provost, can I just advise as well as for the public a new link, there will be a separate calendar invite come out to all members and officers to rejoin uh, the new meeting in 30 minutes. OK then, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.